Welcome to the pro-black perspective where black problems are addressed with black solutions. Your host tonight is the author of the pro-black compendium and Zuberi and the Maroons of Ma'a, the Pan-African nationalist Oni. Oni, what are we discussing tonight? Conscientism. Kwame Nkrumah's political and idea pop philosophy and ideology for decolonization. So, for those of you who might not be familiar, I am Oni Tase, the host of the Pro Black Perspective and the author of the Book of Power. And I recently had a trip to Kwame Nkrumah's Ghana, and it was amazing. This book right here, Conscientism is his philosophy, his ideology for decolonization. In the author's notes, which I'm going to read as well, you're going to see that he's saying, look, this is before the armed struggle, and now it's time to do the armed struggle. So Kwame Nkrumah was about that, and because he was about that, we give honor to him. Obviously, those of you familiar with my literature might say, hey, you know, you tend to have some sort of views about him because, well, look, I'm a Garveyite. And, you know, Garvey was about race purity and about black first, Africa first. And you might, maybe we're going to see that Kwame Nkrumah wasn't about that. Because uh, Kwame Nkrumah does explicitly say in one of his autobiographies, um, the Ghana the autobiography, he does explicitly say, you know, Africa for the Africans, but not in the Garvey sense. So, you know, sometimes you do have ideological uh, battles with uh, other people. And of course, for those of you who are not familiar, just look at what Kwame and Krum, who, who Kwame and Krumah's grandchildren are at this moment, and you'll see why, you know, race purity and anti miscegenation is something in the Garvey school and my school as well. Nevertheless, this is conscientism, and you cannot, you cannot not say this is a great man. Okay, he's a great man because. Unlike most of us, he built a nation for our people. And we could only hope to follow in those footsteps, right? So today I'm going to go over the author's note, the introduction, and of course chapter one. So this is going to be a five-part series. Obviously chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, chapter five as separate episodes. I'm recording these in advance. I usually like to do it live with you guys, but sometimes if I do it in advance, it can go a little bit smoother, it can go a little quicker, and not just that, I am, uh, yeah, I, I just, I just, it's just, this is the decision that is going to be made today, uh, but it's going to be a five-parter, maybe if you want, we could probably do chapter five uh, live, but just let me know in the comments whether you want to join in the chapter five discussion or not, either way, um, I've, I've been told this is a difficult book, so we're going to really go for it and get started. But before we do, I want you all to know that I'm part of a podcasting network, and I really encourage you to engage the other programs on this network. This is D-Web with the Harsh Reality Podcast, asking you to tune in where we tackle the news of the day that affects our community, only on KWAZ Radio. Greetings, everyone. This is Koku from the Bitter Medicine Podcast, inviting you to tune in to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Greetings, fam. Tune in to The Learning Curve with me, the revolutionary matron on KWAZ Radio. You are listening to the Pro Black Perspective on KWAZ Radio. So, if I do sound a little bit under the weather, just for those of you who might have heard, I, I am a little bit under the weather. I really just flew back in from uh, Africa, and it's natural foods, and I came back to you know artificial foods, and not just that, but people who were sickly. Uh, some little girl sneezed on me. And uh, you would think, you know, of course, you know, you don't, you don't, you're not really mad at a little girl for sneezing, um, a maskless girl, no less. But that happens. So if I'm under the weather now, that's fine. But of course, I'm going to recover, which is, you know, it is what it is. But let's go to the author's notes. So right here, since the publication of the first edition of Conscientism, and also this is a really hard word to say. I'm not going to play. 
conscientism in 1964, the African Revolution has decisively entered a new phase, the phase of armed struggle. In every part of our continent, African revolutionaries are either preparing for armed struggle or are actively engaged in military operations against the forces of reaction and counter-revolution. Remember this, that you have to understand, I want you to understand, armed struggle is the way, okay? The issues are now clearer than they have ever been. The secession of military coups, which have in recent years taken place in Africa, have exposed the close links between the interest of neocolonialism and the indigenous bourgeoisie. These coups have brought into sharp relief the nature and the extent of the class struggle in Africa. Foreign monopoly capitalists are in close association with local reactionaries and have made use of officers among the armed forces in order to frustrate the purposes of the African Revolution. Uh, this is a this is the I'm gonna go over a lot of this stuff because it's really critical for us to understand that uh, Wazungu can buy you, you know Wazungu can buy you because Wazungu can buy you 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 know when we're talking about the governments of Africa and how African governments are you know neo-colonialists or they're or they're going along with the system and they're going along with the program yeah because unfortunately these militaries you know might makes right right. And if the military is, like, at the end of the day, the military is the power in almost every nation. You understand? The military is the power in almost every nation. You know, in America, they, they warn about the military-industrial complex, okay? They warn about the military-industrial complex. And the reason why they warn about that is because they say, look, at the end of the day, the masses of people are unarmed or underarmed. And because they're unarmed and underarmed, the people with the weapons, right, control them. Now, you tend to have a political structure that controls these people with the weapons, but one of the things I'm going to do, and I want you to also understand this, is that, and, I, and it looks like maybe he's going to talk about this right, right now, but economics is so fundamental to the human existence to the point where economics is actually more fundamental than politics. So I'm going to discuss this in my, 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 my I'm, I'm intending to discuss this in my next book, but economics is more fundamental than uh, politics. So whereas the politics can control this, the politics nominally controls the military, the reality is that you could sabotage that. The West sabotages that because they understand that economics can undermine the political structure. And this is why you have uh, you know, these dictators in Africa because essentially the West can undermine because the West does produce more wealth. And, 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 and you, you know, we have to, as African people, really understand that wealth building is one of the venues that we are neglecting. But, you know, we're going to get into this book. We're not going to just get into me talking. But I hope you appreciate that, nevertheless. Right? It is a consideration for the new situation in Africa that some changes have become necessary in this edition. They occur principally in Chapter 3. So for those of you who might not know, Chapter 3 is society and ideology. So we'll probably see some new changes in that. Moment. So according to the materialist conception of history, the ultimately uh, determining element in history is the production and reproduction of life. A real life. So obviously, and this is a, this is this is actually pretty interesting too. Uh, but he's gonna go because he's gonna go into how him and Marx never asserted otherwise, right? He said more than this, neither Marx nor I ever asserted. Hence, if somebody twists this into saying that the economic element is the only determining, and he transforms that proposition into a meaningless, abstract, senseless phrase. Marx and I are ourselves partly to blame for the fact that the younger people sometimes lay more stress on the economic side than is due to it. We had to emphasize the main principle vis-a-vis -vis our adversaries who uh, denied it and we had not always the time, the place, or the opportunity to allow the other elements involved in the interaction to come into their rights. But when it was a case of presenting a section of history that is of a practical application, it was a different matter and there's no error was possible. Unfortunately, however, it happens only too often that people think they have fully understood a new theory and can apply it without more ado from the movement that have mastered its main principles and even those not always correctly. 
and I cannot exempt many of the more recent Marxists from this reproach, for the most amazing rubbish has been produced in this quarter, too. Uh, then you see letter from Engels to uh, J. Bach, London, 22nd to 21st and 22nd, September 1860. Okay, so I made a mistake. This is uh, him quoting Mar Engels. I thought it was him. I was like, why is he putting himself... Like, why is he, he, why is he and Marx the same thing? But, yeah, so he's quoting Engels, and he's saying, look... So Engels is saying, oh, no, like, the real determining element of history is the production and reproduction of real life, right? That is the birth rate, in a sense, right? Well, not just the birth rate, but, you know, just birthing people, you know, populations, and so on and so forth. Uh, and he's saying you shouldn't twist this into thinking that it's really the economic element. Right, and that's that's actually worthwhile. That's 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 not something to under underlook. Now, what I would say, I want to I want to really uh, you know compound this because this is not really uh, in Kuma anyway, right? Is that economics? And we have to understand economics in terms of production and reproduction of real life. You know, uh, I, if you guys see, I want you to check out this podcast I did earlier on. On uh, you know African cultures and you know are they real and blah 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 right and and one of the th conclusions there was on um, how you could define economics along the lines of uh, people surviving and thriving, right? Uh, and so surviving and thriving is kind of like production and reproduction of real life. Now I'm going to name it a different way in this next book, but I don't want to spoil it. Obviously, uh, I could say it, uh, but you know, for those of you who are actually interested, you'll probably. Uh, Understand. Uh, let me just say, A U S N, right? And and you'll you'll it's 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 a acronym for what the book's about. But you, those of you who have the book of power probably could glean what that means, uh, you know, from some of the text in the back. All right. So anyway, let's go. Introduction. The lines of the partition of Africa naturally affected the education of the colonized Africans. Students from English-speaking territories went to Britain, as a matter of course, just as those from French-speaking territories went to France, as a matter of course. In this way, the yearning for formal education, which African students could only satisfy a great cost of effort, will, and sacrifice, was hemmed in within the confines of the colonial system. Obviously, colonizers uh, educated the colonized, right? Recording from this straight jacketing, a number of us tried to study at centers outside the metropolis of our administering power. This is how America came to appeal to me as a Western country, which stood refreshingly untainted by territorial colonialism in Africa. So, so you know, that's actually pretty funny. So, <laughs> I did the same thing. I'm going to tell you, I did the same thing. When I was, uh, when I was younger, like I was in my 20s, I was like, I wanted to buy a tennis racket. Okay, I wanted to buy a tennis racket. So because I wanted to buy a tennis racket, I said, I want to go, I don't want to patronize America, right? I want a tennis racket. I don't want to buy one in America because I don't want to support American businesses. So I flew over to London. I was actually already going to London, but, uh, but I uh, flew over to London and said, I'm going to buy here because at least I'm not going to be a part of American imperialism. And so, you know, Kruma does the same thing. And this is the, this is the thing with the miseducation system, right? Is that, and, and, and the thing with nationalism in general is that you are a part of a nation and you tend to make, you know, that national history the history of the world in a sense and kind of ignore that there's, there's other things. So whereas I was like kind of a little bit ignorant of, like, like you know, I'm all anti-racist and like America's so racist, but, you know, the UK is it. And of course, you know, and here's the same thing, you know, uh, uh, Nkrumah is like, you know, uh, the, 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 I don't want to be a part of this colonial, I don't want to be a part of people who have territorial colonialism. And he goes to imperial America that's like the settler colony itself, right? But anyway, to America I therefore went, how and in what circumstances I had already related to my autobiography, Ghana. I spent almost 10 years in the United States of America studying and working for a living, teaching and carrying out my own private researches. The evaluation of one's own social circumstances is part of the analysis of facts and events, and this kind of evaluation is, I feel, as a good a starting point of the inquiry into the relations between philosophy and society as any other. Philosophy and understanding human society calls for an analysis of facts and events and an attempt to see how they fit into human life and so how they make up human experience. In this way, 
philosophy like history can come to enrich, indeed to define the experience of man. The 10 years which I spent in the United States of America represents a crucial period in the development of my philosophical conscience. It was at the universities of Lincoln and Pennsylvania that this conscience was first awakened. I was introduced to the great philosophical systems of the past to which the Western universities have given their blessings, arranging and classifying them with the delicate care lavished on museum pieces. When once those systems were so handled, it was natural that they should be regarded as monuments of human intellection, and monuments because they mark achievements at their particular point in history. Some become conservative in the impression which they make on posterity. I was introduced to, and basically, you know, what he's saying, and this is not really critical, because I'm telling you, you know, we have to have our own universities. Now, luckily, I went to Ghana, like I said, I went to the Ghana University, took a picture in front of the uh, Kwame Nkrumah complex that was a part of the Institute of African Studies or something, uh, uh, the Institute of African Studies, I believe that's the name of it, but, or the Department of African Studies, who knows, but the point is that, yeah, like, he did it, you know, Nkrumah did it. It's really for us at this point, you know, when we talk about nation building, either to build our own type of nation or to build up these nations that are here. And so Nkrumah, he, he did it. So, we, you know, you got to give him props. You got to give him props. And, but notwithstanding that, you know, let's learn from this. Okay, let's learn from this. Uh, and also for those of you who are not subscribed, please subscribe. Uh, understand that we're going to do, I'm going to read Capital. And I'm going to try to read Capital. And I'm going to try to read Marcus Garvey's uh, More Philosophies and Opinions of Marcus Garvey, uh, Volume 3. I'm trying to read that before November ends, okay? Uh, I'm probably not going to read it online for you guys, but I might give a summary. So please subscribe. Please share the channel so that more people can uh, come to this kind of stuff. And, I, 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 you know, I, and those, those, those programs might be a little bit more focused or whatever. So if you, if you prefer focus or what have you, you know, there you have it. But please subscribe and... Uh, let, let me know. Drop some comments. Tell me what you think, right? So anyway, here's, here's Nkrumah again. He says, I was introduced to Plato, Aristotle, Descartes, Kant, Hegel, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, uh, Marx, and other immortals to whom I should like to refer as a university philosopher. But these titans were expounded in such a way that a student from a colony could easily find his breast agitated by conflicting attitudes. Okay. Uh, you know, obviously they're all freaking white, right? <laughs> Attitudes. Uh, and, you know, this is the thing, too. I want you to realize this, too, right? And it's okay that they're white because you're in freaking America, right? And when you're in China, you're going to be learning Lao Tzu and Sun Tzu and so on and so You know, when you're in, in Japan, you're going to be learning whatever the names are. In India, you're going to learn about Buddha and all that kind of... Like, you're supposed to learn about your higher culture in your university. That's the point. You know, and, and we can't fault them for that. You know, you, like, again, he leaves Ghana and goes to freaking America. Like, what, what do you expect? You expect, uh, you know, Osai Tutu. You know, who do you expect there? You know, who do you expect them to be teaching in their higher culture, higher institution, but their own people? You know? Uh, nevertheless, uh, these uh, attitudes can have effects which spread over out over a whole society should such a student finally pursue a political life. A colonial student does not, by origin, belong to the intellectual history in which the university philosophers are such impressive landmarks. The colonial student can be so seduced by these attempts to give a philosophical account of the universe that he surrenders his whole personality to them. When he does this, he loses sight of the fundamental social fact that he is a colonial subject. In this way, he omits to draw from his education and from the concern displayed by the great philosophers for human problems, anything which he might relate to the very real problem of colonial domination, which, as it happens, conditions the immediate life of every colonized African. With single-minded devotion, the colonial student meanders through this intricate, the intricacies of the philosophical systems. And yet, these systems did aim at providing a philosophical account of the world and the circumstance and conditions of their time. For even philosophical systems are facts of history. History. By that time, however, they can come to be accepted in the university for exposition. They have lost the vital power which they had as their first statement. They have shed their dynamicism and polemic reference. This is the result of the academic treatment which they are given. The academic treatment is the result of an attitude to philosophical systems as though they were nothing to them but statements standing in logical relations to one another. Now, I hope you guys can hear me right. I usually hold my mic, but I'm not holding it now, so I hope you guys can hear me right. Otherwise, turn it up. Uh, this is actually a pretty important phrase. So you you see, these people, what he's saying is that they existed in a context, right, that was probably transformative, but by the time they reached the university, it's taken away, it's neutered, you know? 
Uh, I actually, I'll admit, you know, when I was younger, I did like this uh, Play-Doh guy, right? Uh, obviously, don't tell me about my auntie, right? <laughs> She'd be like, wait, 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 hold on a second, right? But, but yeah, I like this Play-Doh guy. And, and if you understand what Play-Doh was doing, was he was trying to uh, postulate, the name of the book is called Republic, right? And he was trying to postulate what would be an ideal society. And, and for those of us who are critical readers, and you could tell I'm a critical reader because this is a critical reading right here, right? Those of us who are critical readers will understand that he's describing what Kemet was. He's describing what he learned in Kemet on what Kemet should be. And he's saying this is the ideal society unlike the society that we have in Greece. Unlike the colony or the former colony of Greece or Mycia, whatever you want to call it, this is what is the ideal human formation. And it's based off of how the human themselves are structured. You know, uh, I still remember this because it was, uh, I, I was able to really manifest it. I mean, really like understand it in a deep way. But the idea was that the human, uh, like human ideas or behaviors or whatever it was, right? Is separated into three aspects, right? The mind, the emotions, and the passions, I believe. Or, or no, the minds, the passions, and the desires, you know? And he's saying that these also function as three different parts of the community. The mind being the ruler, the passions being the uh, auxiliary or the military, if you will, right? And the desires uh, being the, the common folk, the, the market people, the towns, whatever. And he's saying... If you could arrange this in a certain way, right, that would be just like how humans are arranged in a certain way, right? If you could arrange this in a certain way, then you could also, uh, you know, juxtapose, like, compare that, yeah, juxtapose that to uh, human societies and arrange a society in such a way that it's perfect and so on and so forth. And when, you, and when I was studying it, you know, Plato couldn't answer it, but I, I looked at it, you know, with African eyes and I was like, oh, yes, of course. If you, if you arrange it such that the ruler is this and so forth, and of course, if you read my literature, you know what I'm going to say. But notwithstanding, that was, uh, that was him saying, this is what Kevin's like. This is what, the, this is what the African high cultures are doing. This is, what, this is what I learned when I studied in Africa for 20-something years. You know? And so, you know, somebody like me would take that and be like, oh, yes, that's good. Now, of course, we tend to dismiss Plato, but, but and, 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 and for, for good reason, because as you see, what Nkrumah is saying is that, oh, yeah, well, now we just give it an academic treatment. You know, whereas at one point, Plato, like Plato, what he's doing is he's articulating a philosophy and, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the name of Socrates. And Socrates is going to be killed for it. Like, literally, they're going to kill this man, Socrates, for pointing out that, hey, the Egyptians have a better system. You understand? They're going to, and, and they're going to democratically vote for him to be killed. Uh, that's, that's, the, that's the story of, uh, of, 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 of Socrates. Um, but, but yeah, like, it's like, yeah, at that point in history, it was something. It was a philosophical account of the world and the circumstances, and, and it meant something. It was polemic. It was dynamic. And then now we look at it in school, and it's kind of like we just dismiss it. Oh, yes, it's a bunch of white boys. A bunch of, bunch, bunch of white pedophiles. You understand? It's deep, though. It's, this stuff is deep. So I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go into this book, but this stuff is deep. All right. And I hope you appreciate it. If you appreciated that, drop a like. And I got my cash app. I got my cash app. So anytime you like something, just put down a, uh, a uh, you know, like, a, like one of those, those lines, like those Roman numeral lines, right? And, and at, the end of the, at the end of the discussion, you say, look, I liked your stuff, you know, how many times? I liked something you said is how many times? That's how many dollars I'm going to send you. That's it. That's how many dollars I'm going to send you. And, and when I send you these dollars, you can go over to Africa and put those dollars back into our continent. That's it. All right. Uh, this defective approach to scholarship was suffered by different categories of colonial students. Many of them had been handpicked and, so to say, carried certificates of worthiness with them. They were considered fit to become enlightened servants of the colonial administration. Understand, that's what education is. It's, it's really just you becoming an enlightened servant of, 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 of the colonial administration. This is why, like, like I said, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to tell you guys. People are like, hey, man, you know, black people didn't want integration. Yes, you did. Like, why the hell did you go to the university if you didn't want to be integrated? You know, like, why did you go to university if you didn't want to be integrated? I mean, it's, it's said right here. 
you you were you were you have these certificates of worthiness. Be, you were and this was just to say that you are fit to be enlightened servants of the colonial administration. If you're not trying to be a part of the, their administration, why are you getting certified to serve in their administration? You understand? Because because you you could learn engineering without their uh, without their books, I mean, without without going to be certified by them. You said I, I think I can't remember the name of it. But I think it's like you could audit a class, like you could legit go to a class, do everything, and not get any credit. Uh, you know, probably pay for it, sure, but pay less and not get certified or something like that, right? But you don't do that. You 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 decide to be certified to serve in their empire, in their administration. But we ain't even gonna talk about that. The process by which this category of student became fit usually starts at an early age. For not infrequently, they had lost contact early in life with their traditional background. By reason of their lack of contact with their own roots, they become prone to accept some theory of universalism, provided it was expressed in vague, mellifluous terms. I don't know this word. I can probably look it up, but it's okay. Armed with their universalism. And so universalism, if you guys know Marimba Ani, she would talk about that. That's one of the weapons of Wazungu, to make everything seem universal, you know, all this brotherhood. And all that kind of stuff. And and, and unfortunately, Nkrumah, even though he's critical of it, he's going to be about that, nevertheless. So it's kind of like, uh, but whatever. All right, I'm with their universalism. I know some of you are like, man, I wish this brother had his camera on because he's making so many expressions, but I can't see. Well, too bad. Uh, <laughs> I'm with their universalism. They carried away from their university courses an attitude entirely at variance with the concrete realities of their people and their struggle. When they came across doctrines of a combat of nature, like those of Marxism, they reduced them to arid abstractions, to common room subtleties. In this way, though the good graces, through the good graces of their colonialist patrons, these students, now competent in the art of forming not a concrete environmental view of social political problems, but an abstract liberal outlook, began to fulfill the hopes and expectations of their guides and guardians. So this is another thing I want to say, too. That's why I didn't really mess with Marx like that. You know, like, like they give you Marx in the university. They give you Marx in the university. Like, how radical, how revolutionary could this guy be if they're giving, if the, the colonial structure themselves, the guides and guardians themselves are like, hey, check out this guy. He's talking something, right? Uh, because he's, like, because he's giving to you, it's like, it's like, it's like that old, like the old, I guess the side of Shakur would say, you know, like, they're not, like, they're, no, no, no oppressor is going to give you the keys to liberation, right? Now, I'm not going to say, now, here's the thing about Marxism. It's not that it's, it's not that it's valuable, it's not valuable. The, the, the thing is that because it's combative, because it promotes revolution, that's why you should like it. I mean, not that you should like it, but that's the thing that you like about it. Okay, that's the thing you like about it. The thing that you like about uh, any of these things is that you want to just be, you want to like attack the system. Now, I believe firmly, I really truly believe, like I'm, I'm a Garvey, like I told you. So I actually don't mind America for the Americans. And by Americans, I mean the freaking white boy because he killed the Native American, right? Uh, more or less, right? Although I would actually, obviously, I would prefer the Native American or the Amerindian Indian had their land, obviously. Uh, I would prefer that. But, you know, again, like I said, might makes right. Uh, the same, Europe for the Europeans. I don't mind. Asia for the Asians. I don't mind. I'm really about Africa for the Africans. So I understand the want and desire to have revolution in America and all that kind of stuff. But you're not even, it's not even your country. It's not even your land. You have a billion people in Africa. And maybe if you only look at black Africans, maybe 700 million, right? But you have 700 million black Africans on the continent of Africa who are suffering and need, well, not 700, not all 700 million are suffering. Maybe maybe suffering is not really so widespread. Uh, notwithstanding, those are the people that you want to develop. Those are the people that you want to work for. So this idea of, oh, well, let's just fight against this, you know. No. Develop your own people. That's my idea. You know, and if you have to do a revolution among your own people to develop your own people, that makes sense. But if you're doing a revolution against another people uh, and end up, what, developing those other people, that's kind of stupid, in my opinion. But, um, like, Marx is, the main thing, remember, Marx is about doing a revolution in Western Europe to develop Western Europeans. That's what it's about. That's what it's about. It, 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 I mean, if, if you really want to understand Marxism, you have to understand that Marx is, 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 is dealing with this, the reality that wage labor intrinsically 
uh, has its flaws in the sense of as mechanization increases, uh, humans become less valuable. And because humans become less valuable, they can be uh, they can be subjected to all sorts of negative things, notwithstanding the abundance that is available through machinery and technology, right? Uh, so now you have to now you have as a human to do something about this before you are relegated to suffering, right? And there are many ways to do that. You know, obviously one of them is imperialism, uh, and that's the thing that you that's the reason why you would fight against the Western world. But the idea of oh well, let's just you know, like, but that's, that's, again, it's, it's, it's a little complicated, but you didn't really tie in to hear from me. Yes, you did, actually. But you really want to get into this book, so we're going to get into this book, okay? Uh, hopefully it could come up later, but a lot of depth here. And, you know, if you like what I'm saying, obviously check out my own books and, or just, you know, just write some comments or join the Discord. I have a Discord. You could say anything you want. You could even send me a sound bite and be like, hey, what did you mean right here? And we could just, you know wrap it up like like uh well whatever the word is you know talk about it all right <laughs> a few colonial students gained access to metropolitan universities almost as of right on account of their social standing instead of considering culture as a gift and a pleasure the intellectual who emerged therefrom now saw it as a personal distinction and privilege right he might have suffered mild persecution at the hands of the colonials but hardly ever really in the flesh from his wobbly pedestal, he indulged in the history and sociology of this country and thereby managed to preserve some measure of positive involvement with the national processes. It must, however, be obvious that the degree of national consciousness attained by him was not of such an order as to permit his full grasp of the laws of historical development or the thoroughgoing nature of the struggle to be waged if national dependence was to be won. Finally, there was this vast number of ordinary Africans who, animated by a lively national consciousness, sought knowledge as an instrument of national emancipation and integrity. This is not to say that these Africans overlooked the purely cultural value of their studies, but in order that their cultural acquisition should be valuable, they needed to be capable of appreciating it as free men. I was one of this number. So he's telling you that some colonial students, and yeah, you know, this is obviously one of those, you know, house negro feel negro kind of things right where it's like the house negro you know the house colonial student you know he would uh they look at his social you know he would look at his schooling not as so you know as as a gift as a privilege as a personal distinction and he would barely learn and grasp the historical development of the country but see the failed colonial student <laughs> you know what i'm saying yeah all right if you think i'm funny today uh you're not wrong all right no no but uh yeah yeah no but so then he's like yeah but then there's there's us, you know? There was the ordinary Africans who tried to get a national consciousness, sought knowledge of, of national acquisition, and we were one, we understood we had to be free men. That's who I was, you know? That's, but, I, but you know, like, the thing is this, he's not capping. You know what I'm saying? Like, he, he gets to be a free man during the colonial period, okay? He gets to be a free man during the colonial period. So, you know, there's no cap. And that's what it's about. Like, you have to focus on your freedom. You have to focus on your freedom. That's what I want you to understand. But we're going to go into chapter one. Hope you guys are too. I hope you guys enjoyed that so far. Uh, before we go into chapter one, though, I want to remind you that I'm part of a podcasting network. And please subscribe to all of these. If you say to yourself, look, I ain't going to send you nothing on Cash App. Just subscribe to the other channels, okay? Just do that. You know? you like, I ain't going to get your book. I don't know why you say that. But just subscribe. That's it. Subscribe, like, listen, comment. We're, we, we, we're, we're, we're looking to do something different, to build something better. And, and, and all I'm asking is, hey, subscribe. This is D-Web with the Harsh Reality Podcast. Ask you to tune in where we tackle the news of the day that affects our community only on KWAZ Radio. Greetings, everyone. This is Koku from the Bitter Medicine Podcast, inviting you to tune in to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Greetings, fam. Tune in to The Learning Curve with me, the revolutionary matron on KWAZ Radio. You are listening to the Pro Black Perspective on KWAZ 
Radio. All right, welcome back, family. All right, so philosophy in retrospect, so chapter one. So this critical study of the philosophies of the past should lead to the study of modern theories for, or the critical study of the philosophies of the past should lead to the study of modern theories. And I'm going to try to be very careful. I just want to let you guys know. I'm going to try to be very careful because I'm told this is a difficult book. So we're going to see how difficult it is. Uh, so I'm going to try to read it really carefully, really particularly, just so that it's not difficult for you, right? And it's not difficult for me. But we'll see, because, you know, it's been a minute since I've been reading philosophy. So, you know, bear with me, right? The critical study of the philosophies of the past should lead to the study of modern theories. For these latter, born of the fire of contemporary struggles, are militant and alive, right? Theories of today are militant and alive. It is not only the study of philosophy which can become perverted. The study of history, too, can become warped. The colonized African student, whose roots in his own society are systematically starved of sustenance, is introduced to Greek and Roman history, the cradle of modern Europe, and he is encouraged to treat this portion of the story of man, together with the subsequent history of Europe, as the only worthwhile portion. This history is anointed with a universalist flavoring which titillates the palate of certain African intellectuals so agreeably that they become alienated from their own immediate society. And of course, you know, like I said, I want you to really understand, you go to England, you go to France, you go to uh, America, you should be introduced to Greco-Roman and modern European history. The only, like, that, that should be it. There's no reason why you should not be introduced to that if you are in Europe. Just the same, like I pointed out. You go to Chinese University, you should be go you should be studying the foundational Chinese cultures as well as the modern Chinese cultures, right? The modern Asian cultures or what have you, right? The trouble is this. You're an African. You as an African should be going into your own cradle of African history and your own modern African history. You can't complain that the other people are teaching their own people, but we're going to keep going. For the, third card of, uh, for, for the third category of colonial student, it was especially impossible to read the works of Marx and Engels as desiccated abstract philosophers having no bearing on our colonial situation. During my stay in America, the conviction was firmly created in me that a great deal and their thought could assist us in the fight against colonialism. I learned to see philosophical systems in the context of the social milieu which produced them. I therefore learned to look for social contention in philosophical systems. I am not saying, however, that this is the only way to look at philosophy. It is, of course, possible to see the history of philosophy in diverse ways, each way of seeing it being, in fact, an illumination of the type of problem dealt with in the branch of human thought. It is possible, for instance, to look upon philosophy as a series of abstract systems. When philosophy is so seen, even moral philosophers, with regrettable coyness, say that their preoccupation has nothing to do with life. They say that their concern is not to name moral. Their concern is not to name moral principles or to improve anybody's character, but narrowly to elucidate the meaning of terms used in ethical discourse and to determine the status of moral principles and rules as regards the application obligation which they impose upon us so uh, for those of you who might not understand what he's saying and this is not really that complicated so but he what he's saying is that when you're studying philosophy right you might a lot of people who study philosophy might not really try to relate it to the human experience but what he's doing what he's intending to do in this in this in this document is going to relate this to the human experience, you know? And he's saying that even moral philosophers of, of, of the world are not even trying to prove anybody's character, but just to define terms. Basically, he's, you know, he's frustrated with the academic world, you know? And it, th this is something that I actually put inside of my book, too. So the pro-black compendium, right, has this uh, hierarchy of African consciousness. And the, the hierarchy of African consciousness goes from the Ascari being the lowest, right? to the uh, uh, activists, right? Being just the regular, sort of the regular schmegler African. Then the astute, who are the scholarly type, the ones who are articulating things that just have no meaning. And then the oncolbia, where the, those who want to put their, you know, theory into action, quote unquote, praxis, right? And so what Nkrumah is really telling you is, yeah, it's the same thing that all of us kind of have, the frustration with the intellectual tradition that, well, the ivory tower, i.e., or the ebony tower, where in you would study something, 
but you wouldn't, like you would have theory, but you wouldn't have practice. Or you'd have theory, but you wouldn't have praxis. And praxis would be applied theory, right? And so it's just the, the, the normal, you know, disagreement with people, like, like we were talking about moral philosophy, but it has nothing to do with the ethical world around you, right? Uh, so anyway, so when people is, when philosophy is regarded in the light of a series of abstract systems, so we have abstract as opposed to concrete, it can be said to concern itself with two fundamental questions. First, the question is what there is, and second, the question of what there is may be, and second, of, the question of how what there is may be explained. So He's like, this is the abstract way where it's just what there is and how, you know, whatever, right? So the answer to the first question has a number of aspects. It lays down a minimum number of general ideas under which every item in the world can and must be brought. It does this without naming the item themselves, without furnishing us with an inventory, a roll call of the items, the objects in the world. It specifies not particular objects, but the basic type of objects. The answer further implies a certain reductionism. For naming only a few basic types is exhausting all the objects in the world. It brings every object directly under one of the basic types. Uh, let me illustrate my meaning with the following example. So basically he's saying, you know, it's just, you know, it's just intellectual masturbation, you know? I shouldn't use that word, but you understand. It's just not, it's, like he's not impressed, okay? So he's going to give an example. Let me illustrate my meaning with the following example. Thales is the earliest known Western philosopher. Uh, the earliest known Western philosopher held that everything was water. By this, he did not, of course, mean that everything was drinkable, that everything was directly water or constructible from water alone as raw material is, in fact, the heart of his epigram. Thales recognized just one basic type of substance. So that's an example where, you know, he's like a philosopher would be like, hey, you know, and really everything is water, you know, <laughs> you know, and it's like it's like it had nothing to do with reality. Like, not that it has nothing to do with reality, sorry. It has nothing to do with, like, your life. You know, again, Kwame Nkrumah is a colonial student. He's trying to uh, better his country. He's impressed with the Western, uh, you know, the Western society because he's like a village boy. You know, he comes from a small town and then he ends up flying across the ocean or, or you know, on a boat. Who knows, right? But he's he, he ends up inside of another uh, continent, right? And there's buildings, there's people, there's intellectual discussions. It's so different from his village life. And he's like, I want to bring this back to my land, right? I want to bring something like this back to my land. And, and when he's in school, he's being told that, you know, make sure you read Thales and how deep he was. And Thales is like, yeah, well, you know, true. You know, an apple is really water. You know, a rock is really water. And a djembe is really, like, you know, it's like, no, I don't, I don't care about this part. You know, so this is kind of his frustration. But, you know, it's something that a lot of us go through. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure you went through it, right? Uh, like, if you, if you ever, like, you know, like, like, like that's the, it's a common, it's like, you know, we, we, we go through it in high school. We're like, when am I ever going to use this trigonometry? Now, if you haven't used trigonometry since high school, I don't know what you've been doing. I don't know how you cross the street, but, no, I'm joking. <laughs> but seriously, like, it's like that. It's like, when am I going to use this everything is water idea? That's, this is, this is uh, just, this is just a super, this is like an intellectual's way of saying the same thing of how, when am I ever going to use Calculus, you know? Uh, anyway, so for another illustration, let me use Berkeley, the man according to whose understanding the world consisted of spirits and their ideas. For Berkeley, every item in the world was either itself a spirit or some idea possessed by some spirit. It must be said in mitigation that neither Berkeley nor Thales robbed the world of a single term or single item or object. The world was still full of athletes and grapes, bishops and apples, but in both cases, minimal basic types were selected and everything in the world was said to come under them either directly or by an analysis which reduced them to the basic types. That is, for Thales, everything was water or could be reduced to water. For Berkeley, anything, everything was a spirit of ideas or was reducible to spirits and ideas. Spirit or an idea, so on and so forth. But you guys get it. By appeal to both venerable philosophers, I have sought to illustrate the character of answers to the first question of philosophy, the question, what there is, Thale's answer was water, Berkeley's answer was spirits, and their ideas. Uh, by the way, again, I'm going to remind you, I might be sick, so, you know, obviously stay away from me, but no, no, no. no. But uh, if you hear me sniffle and all that kind of stuff, I don't mean to do it on camera, I mean on uh, on audio, but, you know, like, like, excuse me, okay? I don't mean to be rude. All right. So in this, and not that I say it's rude, but, you know, I just, like, sometimes people don't want to hear that. Like, I don't want to hear it. Right. In this first answer, philosophers, in fact, tackle the question of the origin of things. Thales traces its origin to water. 
Berkeley to spirits and their ideas. In effect, however, they both seek the origins of the varieties of objects of the world and something which itself forms part of the world. There, thus, arises a supervening need to discourse about the possible origins of the cosmic raw material. So, let me say he's going to go into the religion to talk. You, know, you can tell by the whatever. Well, basically, he's saying that, you know, if you're talking about water, but water is already a part of the world, so how could you, you know what I mean? And then spirit and ideas, but they're already a part of the world. Like, like, like basically, you're like, where did these come from? You know? Like, everything is water, sure, but where did water come from? And then you come into this religious discussion. Uh, this pseudo religious discussion, but anyway, you, you, you know, I'm not really into the Christianity thing, and that's actually one of the things I'm going to be a little bit skeptical about with this book. I'm just going to give you a four, uh, 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 give you to you early, is that you know Kwame Nkrumah is not necessarily anti Abrahamic religion. In fact, he embraces it, and because he embraces it, you know, I'm probably going to be at odds with it. But you know, who cares, right? All right, so anyway, <laughs> like I just let let you know in advance that. If I don't come off as like a pastor, you'll know why I'm not a pastor. All right. So it is thus the requirement to explain the cosmic raw material comes to the. It is in, it is thus that the requirement to explain the cosmic raw material comes to raise the second question of philosophy. There are two aspects to its answer. It is the first aspect. The explanation offers an account of the origin of the cosmic material. If, as according to Thales, water was all that God needed when, on the eve of creation, he girded up his loins, then, first of all, the answer to the second question offers an account of the origin of the cosmic raw material, in this present case, water. In the second aspect, it is an account of the extent of the cosmic raw material. It lets us know whether God, addressing himself to the task of the day of creation, can find that there is an economic shortage, that is to say, a shortage of raw material, it lets us know whether an error of or costing can come to frustrate God's plan for the universe building. All right. So obviously, you know, whatever. In the urgency of the second question of philosophy, can we... Wait. In the urgency of the second question of philosophy, can we detect a certain anxiety about the principle of sufficient reason? According to this principle, everything has an explanation why it is as it is and not otherwise. Has the cosmic raw material a cause or explanation or has it not? To deem it not to have one is to enter a plea of exception against the principle of sufficient reason. Now, the pressure to withhold a cause from the cosmic raw material, that which is the matrix of the universe and from which springs everything else which there is or can be, takes its beginning from the fact that whatever cause is proposed for it must be vexed by persistent problems. So, you already see this. He's saying that there's a principle of sufficient reason, right? Uh, like, the urgency is basically a principle of sufficient reason, and he's like, uh, everything has an explanation why it is and not otherwise. Uh, and if it doesn't, if you have something that is an exception to that, then it's like, why is this, an, why is this an exception, right? Uh, so according to the hypothesis that what we seek to explain is the basic raw material, any proposed cause for it can only itself arise from the basic raw material. Therefore, it must either be part of the basic raw material or be a product of it. If it is a part of it, then the basic raw material is being said to be a cause of itself. If the cause is a product of the basic raw material, then an effect is being said, paradoxically, the cause is own to cause its own cause. A circle of a very vicious kind is thus described. Furthermore, to say that what there is is self-cause, speaking without bias to deny it is, has a cause at all. So, obviously, this is one of the, you know, it's like, like, I can see why this book is considered difficult because what he's doing is, it's like, he's like, he's like, oh man, this philosophy is so stupid. Look how stupid the philosophy is. And then he explains some stupid philosophy. And if you're reading it with the intent of understanding the stupid philosophy, you're going to be like, what am I reading, right? So basically here though, just to explain for people who might be like, what am I reading, right? Uh, it's like this, water. Like, like say you say water is the basic element, well, basic raw material. The question becomes, where's water from? And if your answer is, well, water created water, it's like, what does that even mean? Now, if you say that water is not the basic material, but something is more basic than water, then the question becomes, then how is water the basic raw material? You know? Now, obviously, in science, you might say, well, if you use the word water, you might be like, well, water is actually hydrogen and two oxygen. And then, therefore, uh, water is not the basic material, but hydrogen and oxygen are, right? Or, or at, if you really, realistically speaking, you might say hydrogen. Now, if you were to go into the science more for, for the deeper, you might be like, well, even though the uh, hydrogen, which is like an atom, right, um, you know, uh, is basic, you know, there's something even more basic than the atom, which is the proton and uh, the proton, neutron, and the uh, 
uh, the electron, right? I'm not 100 percent sure if the proton, if the if the uh, if the atom has a. No, I don't think the atom has a neutron, but uh, I believe it's a neutron. But 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 the uh, yeah, you might be like it's even more basic. Then you say, well, if the if the proton is the fundamental, or if the atom is a fundamental, where do these come from? And that's where you know cosmology and astrophysics come in. And if, for those of you who might be like, well, Oni, why are you talking about cosmology and astrophysics? What do you know about that? Actually, <laughs> my degree was in physics, so that's why I'm talking about it. <laughs> you know, I, I was I was trying to be a colonial servant in physics, right? But anyway, uh, but anyway, but uh, but you know, eventually I was like, I ain't gonna be no colonial servant for that. But but that's pretty much uh, the whole uh, quote unquote in the in the in the physical world, the physics world. We, we, you know, you call that the quote unquote Big Bang theory. But realistically speaking, it's more so uh, this realization that the universe. Uh, very likely has an age, uh, has, a, has, a, has a relatively uh, short age, uh, you know, or has a, has a, has a, has a, has a fixed age uh, based off the cosmic radiation background. And basically the cosmic radiation background is essentially this realization that no matter what direction you look at, uh, the universe is uniform, uniformly, uh, has a uniform radiation background of, I want to say, like, 14 billion years, right? But 14 billion light years away is to say that the light has traveled very evenly around the universe from uh, all directions. And so the, the the statement is that, and it's all redshifted, so the statement is that the, uh, I believe it's redshifted, right? So what redshifted means is that it's going away, it's receding from you. So everywhere you look, there's light going away from you Right, that left where you were 14 billion years ago, uh, or around where you were, and obviously not exactly where you are, but around 14 billion years ago, they all uniformly are in all directions. And what that tells you is that the universe once was uh, very, well, it was much smaller uh, for, you know, it was much smaller 14 billion years ago. And so the conclusion becomes that. But again, that has nothing to do with what he's talking about. What he's talking about is philosophers who, instead of you know, looking at this uh, scientific data or whatever, or, or scientific observations are just thinking of, hey, you know, the world is just, you know, it's just, you know, it's kind of like metaphysics and, and just saying, hey, you know, the water is just water and water is the basic thing. But then it's like, it does run into a problem of what's more fundamental than water or what's more fundamental than spirits and so on and so forth. And so, again, like I said, it's going to be confusing if you look at it from a, uh, if you, a, a like, it's going to be confusing. Like, it's better to just skip over it but I just wanted to explain to people because some people, like I've read like maybe three people uh, who said that this was a difficult book. So I'm just letting you know that these are the kind of things you should skip over uh, if, if like it's not, that, it's not that fundamental to the, you know, the real thesis, which is the philosophy and the reality of decolonization, right? This is more so just letting you know what colonization, I mean, like what he went through in philosophy, right? All right, so in this, there is a broad... There is as broad a hint as one can desire that the question of the origin of what there is has no affirmative answer, nor indeed is the vicious circle that the only tribulation which awaits an affirmative answer. If a cause is suggested for the cosmic raw material, this neurotic insistence on a cause will open up an infinite regress about the cause of the cause of the cosmic material and so on. So, you know, I kind of just did that with the proton thing, neutron. You know, it's like that's what it is. You know, it, again, it's, it's, he's really not interested in this he's kind of like right here he's just showing you his chops you know like one of the things about when you're writing a book is that and i don't know like he doesn't have to prove anything because he's kwame and Krumah. but at the same time you know as african people we kind of do want to prove ourselves prove ourselves worthy prove ourselves steady in fact i can tell you this in fact sometimes i would i would talk with people and they would be like oh but you're not familiar with european philosophy you know or you're not familiar with Physics, you're not really, you know, they assume that because if you're just talking about Africa, right, they assume that you have it, the breadth, the, 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 the and so you have the, like the breadth, the, the, the knowledge, the, the wherewithal, the, the, so, so, so you have to like prove yourself uh, to people, uh, otherwise they will, they will, uh, you know, they, they'll be like, why are you even talking about this, you know? If Kwame Nkrumah just jumps right into, Decolonization philosophy and ideology, you know, and ideology, and he doesn't even mention uh, uh, Marx. He doesn't mention Plato. Doesn't mention any of these people, right? What happens is when you're reading it, you're saying to yourself, "Yeah, but have you considered these other people?" So what what Kwame Nkrumah is doing here is saying, "Look, I've freaking considered Thales. You know what I mean? Like I've done my homework. 
you know, and, and I'm worthy. Now, again, you know, why would somebody have to say they're worthy? Again, when you're African, you might have that kind of a, a, of a, of a you know, like that setback in a sense. Not setback, but um, you might have that kind of, I don't know, I don't, you guys know what I'm talking about. Like people in the Western world, they know what I'm talking about, where you kind of just prove yourself, you know? Like it's unfortunate because this guy is like the president of Ghana. But even then, like imagine you're the president of Ghana, like, like you, you know, the first president of Ghana, you walk in around London, like, is it really that respected to you? You know, like, there's still that, there's still that, you know, that, that it, it's, you know, I guess Marcus Garvey calls it the, uh, the mark of uh, shame or the mark of slavery or what have you. But it's just, it's complicated. But basically, he's just, like, flexing here, right? Uh, but, but not like a good flex, more like a flex like, you know, Look, I'm, 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 like I am a man, you know, and it's, it's sad to see in, in such a, uh, you know, esteemed individual. But, you know, of course, you know, time will esteem him. But, you know, remember that all of us are just human beings. You know, all of us go through the same thing. Kwame Nkrumah was definitely, uh, like he, he, he was definitely like we can look at him as this was an amazing person. But you have to remember he was just a colonial student at one point. He was just an African going to American schools at one point, the same kind of schools that you go to, University of Pennsylvania, University of Lincoln. He was just a student in those schools. So when you see a student in those schools with their insecurities, or you see an African immigrant in those schools with their insecurities and, and people teasing them and people this and people that, that that's what Kwame Nkrumah went through. And, and when you understand that and, 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 and say, hey, well, look, yeah, he might have insecurities as well, right? Yeah, we have insecurities. You know, uh, you know, for the, like I'll tell you, for instance, when I was in university, I tried not to wear. Uh, no, no. I, I, well, well you, you know, you try not to like wear a hoodie, maybe. Or you try not to wear bag. I, I wore baggy jeans. I go front. But like, no, I, no, I think I, I got rid of my baggy jeans. Yeah. You, you, you try not to wear baggy jeans. You try not to be associated with the people that, you know, everybody dislikes or something. You know, sometimes you 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 know, I, there's this, this woman, I think her name is Marilyn Fry. I'm not too sure. But she's talking about the mythical norm and how we define ourselves against the what what's the norm in the society, what the society actually likes and indulges. You know, the middle class white boy, you know, healthy and all that kind of stuff. That, that that's what we define ourselves against. And and when we when we don't, and we might we might try to follow that image, or we might try to go against that image. But regardless, it's like when you were in school. You know, like I tell you, I was at one time I was I stopped this young girl walking and she was like uh uh i was like hey what ethnicity are you because she was she was she was uh she was like she she was interesting like she was interesting like she had an interesting aesthetic right so i say what what ethnicity are you and she goes why well, they call me an oreo and i'm like damn you know even when i was in school they would say the word oreo you know oh you're reading oh you're doing math that's some more white stuff you know it's like when when we understand this that Kwame Nkrumah went through the same thing. You know, Asada Shakur details in her book how people were like, uh, like how she herself, Asada Shakur herself, when she was younger, some brother was like fawning over her, right? Like, oh, I want to talk to this girl. And she was like, get away from me, you're too dark. Asada Shakur in elementary school, like the fact that this is so systemic, so systematic, you, you, you have to realize that when, when, when you come across these kind of things, you know, there are, it's, it's going to be, like, you have to look at it like these are human beings, too. These are human beings existing within a context. This is what Kwame Nkrumah was actually saying earlier in the book, which was, you know, these philosophies are coming out of a context. And the context of this is that, yeah, he was a colonial, he was a colonized student, he developed co decolonization philosophy, but he, it's not to say that he wasn't, in the colonial uh, system himself. Um, now, actually, I, those of you who don't know, I have a, uh, I have a young son, right? The guy just used the restroom, so I'm gonna put this commercial back, uh, and I'm gonna go tend to, you know, basically you gotta wipe uh, your, your kid, you know, uh, you know, a lot of you don't like like your parents enough. I don't know why, but remember that I, your parents really did wipe your your derriere, so. Uh, I'm going to go do that, and we'll come back after the break. 
This is D Webb with the Harsh Reality Podcast. Ask you to tune in where we tackle the news of the day that affects our community only on KWAZ Radio. Greetings, everyone. This is Koku from the Bitter Medicine Podcast, inviting you to tune in to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Greetings, fam. Tune in to The Learning Curve with me, the revolutionary matron on KWAZ Radio. You are listening to the Pro-Black Perspective on KWAZ Radio. (laughs) Sorry, I put up the wrong image, right? Uh, (coughs) That was my, uh, I should delete that one. But yeah, um, so so yeah, that's that's what you have. Um, Like I said, I just have to wash my hands really quickly. Um, (laughs) All right. Uh... In some, there's a denial. Okay, so did I read this part? I'm not too sure. Yeah. All right, so I didn't. So it says, in some, then the denial that what there is has a cause is a claim of an exception to the principle of sufficient reason or in tones of moderation. It is a caveat that this principle is only applicable inside the world and not from outside to the world. It applies only to transformations of the cosmic raw material only to its products, to apply the law to the cosmic raw material is to fall into the mob contradiction. Even to say that there is war, that it is its own cause is to make a merely formal salutation to the principle, for there can be no scientific or significant difference between a thing being self-caused and it being uncaused. Right? Uh, he's like, there's no, yeah, there's no, there's no, you know, obviously, like I said, he's just doing his chops. But, you know, something cannot be... Uh, uncaused and self-caused like there's no there's like it clearly can't be self-caused and uncaused right he's everything is caused and you know one of the things that white people would do uh i think he's going to talk about it here is that like one of the white well, white philosophers because i told you i read some white philosophy at one point or western philosophy at one point and they would always be like the great cause is god you know or or you know their god you know was you know was no god but uh Anyway, it was you know obviously for somebody like me it's ridiculous, but uh, I think he's gonna actually talk about it because I see I saw the on the side the word atheism, so we'll see what that means, right? So however it is, and not to say that I, not to say that I'm an atheist per se, but you know I don't like my thing is that this Wazungu Wazungu just created this motherfucker, you know, like he created this god of his, so yeah. All right, so uh, however it is worthy of note how this second question of philosophy in its first aspect stands vis a vis. Theological beliefs, right? So theology is obviously the religion stuff. All right. In this aspect, the question relates to the possible origin of the cosmic raw material. It relates, if you like, to its possible excuse from the principle of sufficient reason. If this principle is thought to apply to it, if that is to say the cosmic raw material is conceived to have an origin, then one adopts a theist or a deist position. In either case, one posits a force transcendent to the cosmic raw material and which occasions it. One is a theist if one supposes that this the transcendent force is nevertheless imminent after some fashion in what they is continuing to affect it one way or another. If, on the other hand, uh, one holds a force to be strictly transcendental and excludes it from the world once made, then one is a deist. So this is the difference between a theist and a deist. A theist, they're saying, is that, all right, basically, so, so you know how it is. Wazungu says there's a great creator, okay? There's a great creator, and then the theist point of view is that this creator... Um, continues to intervene with their creation. Okay? Uh, and you kind of see that here. He says, uh, suppose that the transcendent force, transcendent force being the creator, right? Uh, or, or the creator in this Wazungu theology, right? Uh, is nevertheless imminent after some fashion in what there is continuing to affect it one way or another, right? So if you're continuing to affect whatever you created, then that's theism, right? Whereas if you just created something and left it alone, that's deism, right? Now, I didn't actually know this different uh, philosophical, uh, this philosophical distinction. Uh, so, it's, so like I said, I could see how this is complicated, but, you know, again, it's not really complicated yet. So hopefully it does get complicated later so that I could be stumbled a little bit, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, if, however, the principle of sufficient reason is thought not, so, not to apply to what there is, and the world is thereby denied and outside, then one is an atheist. So, if, however, the principle of sufficient reason is thought not to apply to what there is, 
and the world is thereby denied and outside, then one is an atheist, right? So the idea is that there was no creator, right? That would be atheism. For this purpose, pantheism is but a kind of atheism. It is atheism using theological language. Um, okay, so that's actually pretty interesting. Pantheism, which is uh, pantheism. I'm going to guess he doesn't say it yet. Maybe he's going to say it later. But if he's talking about the idea of multiple uh, deities or something, right, then he's like, well, that's just a different kind of atheism, which is actually a very interesting sentiment if you, if that's what he means. Now, maybe I have to look up the word pantheism. The only reason why I didn't do it is because, like, I, I should open up this dictionary stuff, but maybe I should look up this word. I'm going to look it up really quickly um, just to see what this means because there was this uh, recent discussion on uh, atheism in Africa and so on and so forth, and... Um, this this idea was that you know Africans didn't have uh, atheism, but if pantheism, so let's see, let's see what pantheism is. It says a doctrine which identifies God with the universe or regards the universe as a manifestation of God. Uh, okay, uh, worship that admits or tolerates all gods. So it could be one of the two, but yeah. So a doctrine which identifies God with the universe or regards the universe as a manifestation of God. So uh, pantheism. So I made a mistake. Well, pantheism would be. Yeah, that's actually, it's actually pretty interesting still. It's actually pretty interesting. So the idea that, you know, the omnipresent God, in a sense, right? So um, omnipresent in the sense that the whole universe is itself the uh, creator. Uh, uh, and of course, that's kind of, in essence, what Big Bang Theory is uh, without... Um, so Big Bang Theory probably would be pandeism, to be honest, right? <laughs> if we're going to use these terms. Uh, because you know it's not intervening with itself per se, or it's not conscious per se in the uh, in the Big Bang theory uh, paradigm. But the idea is that that is another kind of atheism. And what's interesting is that, like I said, there was a discussion on whether atheism was an African thing, and they were like, "Well, no, Africans had this, and that, you know, blah blah blah." But what's interesting about that is uh, pantheism would be a more appropriate uh, comment on in regards to. What the uh, African belief was, and, and if well, some African beliefs were in terms of you know everything around us having spirit and, and being a part of this uh, creation and so on and so forth. Uh, that said, um, yeah, it's, you know, in Krumah reasons that that's atheism, that that's another form of atheism, um, uh, but with just with theological language. Um, but but let's actually try to understand in the sense of uh, for this purpose, uh, he says. Thought not to apply to where it is. The world is thereby denied and outside. Then one is atheist. Okay, so he doesn't really go into what he means by pantheism. So, you know, it is what it is. So in other aspects of philosophy, second question, the extent of the cosmic raw material is determined. The basic consideration is whether the raw, this raw material is infinite or, or is finite or infinite. Hence, the driving interest in the world should be permanent. Here, the driving interest is that the world should be permanent. So, um, oh yeah, so the question is whether the raw material is finite or infinite. And if you, you know, if it's finite, uh, then the world is finite. Whereas if it's infinite, then the world is, uh, is not, like the world won't end, right? So there are various ways in which the driving interest is satisfied. For example, some people say that it is impossible that nothing should exist, that the statement that nothing exists cannot be conceived is true. And this, by the way, in, is one case in which the truth of a proposition determines reality and not vice versa. Uh, in this way, many come to be satisfied that at any given time there must be something. In this way, also, the desire for permanence comes to be more than satisfied. But it cannot be inferred from this non-vacuity of the universe that some given object will always exist. It is therefore impossible to infer the existence of God from the fact that something must always exist. So again, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting, right? In the sense of... Like this is this is kind of like an opinion in a sense that nothing, uh, that 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 it's impossible for nothing to exist. Uh, of course, we have no idea what that would mean, um, but clearly, like at the end of the day, um, at the end of the day, you could have nothing existing somewhere, you know, um, uh, like just just in terms of time space isolation, you know, there could be a a place in space that's just nothing's there 
uh, and to make that expand. Now, now how that could possibly result in uh, a wider body, who knows, right? Uh, the relationship between energy and matter does come into question and, and all that kind of stuff. But it, it could be that nothing existed before the Big Bang. Or if we say nothing exists, we might say maybe it was just energy and then matter came, you know? Uh, but who knows, right? Uh, or mass, if you want to call it. Anyway, so other person is displaying more passion for controversy than for philosophical cogency. So that the world is periodic, that the universe repeats itself ad infinitum in cycles of time. But for this, and so so basically, like I said, he's just going over the breadth of his of his uh, intellectual background. You know, this is not really fundamental to understanding or, or learning. It's, it's really just that thing that black people do. You know, not just black people; white people do it too. But uh, it's just something that people do to say, "Hey, look." This is why I'm qualified to do this. Like how before when I was talking about physics and then, you know, I pretended that you responded by saying, why are you talking about physics? What do you know about physics? And it's like, yeah, well, I got a degree, you know, this is, this is what it is, you know, like he's talking about uh, the universe repeating itself ad infinitum. Like this has nothing to do with decolonization or anything. This is just kind of like, yeah, I'm familiar with other theories outside of of, of, you know, the theories of today, right? Um, or or I'm, 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 I'm familiar with less familiar or less common theories, right? So the, the universe repeats itself ad infinitum in a cycle of time, but for this, it is unnecessary that the inertial basic raw material should be infinite in extent, for however meager it may be, it has been infused with the phoenix power of self-regeneration in it being said to repeat itself. Uh, unfortunately, the problem of time is a stumbling block to the cyclic theory. Whatever is multiple can be ordered in a series. It is evident that the cycles of the universe must, by reason of being multiple, admit of order in a series. Accordingly, these cycles can be associated with a linear time dimension which extends infinitely beyond any one of the cycles themselves. Indeed, this time dimension must order the cycles themselves because some of them must come before others. Now, it is possible to conceive this time dimension as a self-spanning a universe in which the alleged cycles, instead of being universes, merely spell out seasonal changes inside a super-universe. When this is done, one starts from a series of universes and strings them together into a super-universe. Thus, the cyclical nature of the universe plays away like a bad dream. So, again, you know, this idea is right here is saying, look, even if you were to say, hey, you know what? There is no origin of this material, right? There's no origin of this material because uh, it's really like a cycle. You still say, well, if it's a cycle, then there was an initial origin as well. And so now it's like, well, no, it's not even an initial origin. It's like a freaking circle. It's a circle. You know, they just keep, like, like there was no initial point. It just was, you know? And it's like, yeah, well, that doesn't make any sense. But again, it's just, it's just... At this point, it's just, 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 you know, like, it's really just, you know, in, in physics, you know, they call it Gadanka experiments, right? Where you just think of something. But, like, you're basically trying not to, like, you're basically trying to answer something that, that really can't be answered by you, you know? What happened before the universe? You don't know. Uh, you probably never know. Um, and it's not that important. I mean, it, it is the point. It's not, oh, my gosh, she's going to say Wittenstein. So, I know Wittenstein. <laughs> I tell you, one time I had this debate with somebody. All right, let me just not... Yeah. I know you're like, what? This guy's getting excited over some white boy. Nah, I'm not, but like, what is that? But like I said, this is like showing the breath, you know? Like showing the breath that you have, right? Like, like, because again, you know, he could just say the universe has a cosmic origin, blah, blah, and then ignore all this stuff, and then somebody's going to write him and be like, have you considered the super universe theory? You know what I mean? Uh, so it's just like, that's like one of those things where, where you just got to like exhaust the, the, the breadth of your field of study so that people will know, okay, this guy is not playing. You know, okay, this person's actually well read. Let's see what's going on. This is just it's just a common thing in in Western literature to be like, yeah, I've I've done my research. This is like I've done my research. I know about super universes. Cause even I can tell you I didn't know about super universes, right? Uh several persons who reject the cyclic so he's gonna say the people who reject it, you know? <coughs> Like, it's that deep. So, several persons who reject the cyclic theory acclaim the universe as an infinite presence and seek in this way to make it permanent. But an infinite universe is no more a permanent universe than it is a finite one. Even a universe which is infinite may come to an end. 
irrespective of whether it is infinite in time and space or both. A universe which is infinite in time can end in the same way as a negative integer, for it is sufficient that it should have existed infinitely backwards. A universe which has existed infinitely backwards can cease at any time without its infinitude suffering decreases. Suffering decrease. Its cessation would be comparable to a cut at any point in the series of negative integers. Given any negative integer, there's always an infinity of negative integers which lie behind it. As to a universe which is infinite in space, it can cease to exist at any time without prejudice to its size. Right? So he's like, hey, uh, yeah, so you get it. It's like, He's, he's pointing out the different mathematical and philosophical contradictions, even in statements like, oh, the universe is infinite, and therefore, like, the universe is already infinite, and therefore it's going to be infinite. And it's like, no, even that is not philosophically agreed on. Like, basically, he's, he's versed in philosophy. That's what he's saying, right? In order that the universe, or he's versed in Western philosophy, right? Uh, in order that a universe should be permanent, it must have neither beginning nor end, like the continuity of the negative with the positive integer. So he's like, you can't be permanent unless you had no beginning. Okay? Because as long as you had a beginning, you are not permanent. Right? And this is just like, a, again, like just philosophical nonsense. You know, like again, it has nothing to do... But, you, but, you, but you, when you're reading this stuff, you have to... You have to know when you're just... Like, you have to read things on a psychological level as well. That's the thing that I, I, a lot of people don't do. Like, I, was, I, I sometimes have discussions with people, and I'm like, you, you got to look at it. You got to look at things from a subconscious level, too. You got to look at people from a subconscious level, too. What is, what is Nkrumah's subconscious as he's writing this, as he's saying this stuff? Like, what is his subconscious as he's writing this stuff? Why is he talking about whether or not a universe can be permanent where if it doesn't have a beginning or an end? What does that have to do with anything? Right? So you look at it from a subconscious level and you say, oh, well, he's just establishing the foreground, right? Or the background for, right? He's the wrong word, right? <laughs> exactly wrong word. But he's just establishing the background for as to why you'll be reading a philosophy book from the president of Ghana. You know? And the, the background is because he knows his damn philosophy. All right? Because you, you're going to read somebody else and they're going to say something like this. And you'll be like, oh, wait, the president of Ghana already told me that. You know what I mean? And, and, and pretty much he's like, well, can the queen of England do that? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that's, all, that's all he said. This is just a flex. This is just a black man saying, look, you know, I am that. All right. Uh, or I know what these people are saying. I'm about to show you something different. I'm about to show you something. So, you know, this is pretty much that. I'm about to show you something. You know, like, like right before you go on the dance floor, and you, like you see somebody come, come on the dance floor and they like pop it. You know what I'm saying? And you're like, oh, okay, they about to do something. You know what I mean? Or, or, or you're like, you know, I don't tip your hat to the side. Or, or even like, take your coat off. You're like, you're about to go to a fight, and you take your coat off. You already know, right? You know what I mean? Like, like you already know. Or, or take your nails out and pull your hair out. You know, you already know what's about to fin fin happen. So this is what this is like the intellectual equivalent of that. It's like, yeah, okay, well, look, the universe ain't even permanent. You know what I'm saying? The universe ain't even permanent because it, it if it has a beginning, then it's not permanent. Just like, just like you go to negative and positive numbers. Then you're like, okay, it's about to say something. You know what I'm saying? But <laughs> anyway, I'll just try to y'all. All right. So nearly all who consider the question of the permanence of the world seek to anchor the world in a foundation of a permanent cause, which they identify with God. In this way, they hope that the universe will duly be protected, but all postulate something as... Uh, as abiding throughout the extent of time, be it in the universe itself, cycles of it, or God. Indeed, the uh, reluctance to conceive time as empty of all content is another manifestation of desire for permanence. For the historical process is here accepted as an everlasting one, in order that time should not be disemboweled. In this way, permanence is secured. By the way, for those of you who might be wondering, what is physics? What do physicists, or what do astrophysicists say about the permanence of the universe? Uh, no, they, they, astrophysicists believe it's a finite half beginning and that at some point the universe is going to be, is going to appear empty from uh, our solar system, assuming our solar system survives that long. But essentially because of, there's this thing called dark energy, um, dark energy is uh, pushing the universe out, uh, making the universe spread uh, apart from itself so that galaxies are actually uh, 
receding from each other or spreading out from each other to the point where uh, everything at eventually at some point in far distant future that when you look up in the sky, you will not be able to see any stars because they're too far. Uh, uh, although maybe you probably still would see stars, but uh, but again, it's like oh, well, when you look to see how far the stars are, uh, they are like fourteen billion light years away. You know, uh, like the closest stars will not be as close as they are today. That's that's the point. Um, but of course, obviously, Earth is not going to exist at that time either. Uh, you know, barring some sort of technological marvel, uh, you know, the, the the sun that we have is bound to explode, you know? Uh, but, uh, you know, explode and, you know, take the Earth with it, obviously. Uh, hopefully, yeah. I mean, you know, probably people assume that humans will not be on the Earth any longer, but notwithstanding that, the, uh, the, the idea is that the only this super cluster that we're a part of might still be visible to us, but maybe not even that. You know, it just might be that the universe is just spread out to the point where it just seems like a dark emptiness where you would be under the impression that you are in the center of the universe. And what's interesting is that it's like everywhere in the universe is the center of the universe, which is really interesting, right? Anyway, uh, it's really interesting. Sorry, nearly all who consider the... Uh, yeah, so I think I read that part. All right, so that was just my uh, description of uh, physics, so on and so forth. And yet, at first blush... Um, hold on a second. I'm trying to figure out what page I'm on. Okay. And yet, at first blush, an infinite existence seems to be no less miraculous than a spontaneous, uncaused existence. It is at least clear that the world cannot come to be known as infinite or finite. It can only be by the provision of a theoretical conception that is said to be finite or infinite. If the world is finite, it must be because it is so conceived. If it is infinite, it must be because it is so conceived. The finitude or infinitude of the world is logically incapable of experimental exposure. Nor is it ever even possible to construct a model of the universe, for any model is itself a constitu constituent of the universe, whereas it is a logical characteristic of any model that it must stand apart from that which it seeks to illumine. It cannot form a part of it. So he's like, you know, this is just philosophy, philosophy uh, in a sense of, but like, this is the philosophy that he learned. You know, and the, the idea is that you cannot make a model of the universe because you can't make a model of something while being inside of it. You know, you can't make a model of a home or a house in its completion while being inside of the house. You know, like you're not going to describe the outside of the house pretty much. Right. Uh, so what is the universe from the outside? And again, this is more like a philosophical, you know, yada, yada. Now, obviously, physicists, like I said, astrophysicists, that's my degree, uh, you know, they do attempt to understand the universe and do experiments and so on and so forth. But of course, they're never doing experiments from outside the universe. Like, that doesn't even make any sense. Uh, like, like, we don't have the lifetime for that, you know, to be outside of the universe. Uh, and, and it's assumed that there's no, uh, like there's no border of the universe, right? In the sense that, uh, well, in the sense that, you know, when I tell you about the cosmic radiation background of 14 billion, you know, light years, right? The thing with that was that it was evenly uniform in all directions. So to say that away from wherever you are, the borders of the universe is 14 billion light years away. So what does that mean? Is it really uh, evident or clear? But, uh, you know, like the assumption would be, oh, well, maybe, I'm a, maybe we're near the center of the universe, Right. Uh, but it might not be that that's the case. It just might be that uh, that the universe is is like yeah, it's just it's just really like again, it's a really uh, phenomenal thing to think about. And hopefully, you're enjoying it as much as I am. But like I said, I, I did astrophysics, and and for, for those of you who might not know, I actually did astrophysics because I read Plato, and Plato was like, these are the seven uh, liberal arts that they taught in Kemet. Right, he's like they teach this stuff in ancient Egypt, the seven liberal arts, and you should do all seven of these. And so I looked through the list, and I was like, I did this, I did that, I did that. I didn't do astronomy, and so I went and got a degree in astronomy. Right, so that's a pretty interesting question. But I didn't even know about ancient Egypt that well. You know, I came back to the literature, and I was like, wait, what? You mean I was like all this time, like from high school, 
I just wanted to learn like a black man. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but yeah, like I said, you know, like that's why I can't be too mad at Poyo. So I know went inside. Uh, this was somebody I knew from a debate. He said something like all well-founded belief is based off of belief that is unfounded, you know. So I, 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 I was in this one debate. I tell you guys about this sometimes where these, these, this Marxist and this, I believe it was like a capitalist or a moderate, whatever. They were debating. And at one point, the Marxist was like, you know, hand him his ass, right? He was whooping his butt. These are white boys, right? And then the other white boy just said, you know, as Wittenstein said, all well-founded belief is based off of a belief that's unfounded. And the white boy was like, and the Marxist was like, yeah, you're right. And then they just, like, he just lost the debate that way. I was like, What? You know, <laughs> but anyway, uh, so it's pretty interesting, but it's, it's just a common thing where white people are just like, we're actually pretty ignorant. And it's like, yeah, you're right. And then they don't, they don't try to be right anymore. It's pretty interesting. All right. So, anyway, but especially if the universe is infinite, it is impossible to construct a model of it. The construction of a model implies achievement, a finish. And to start and complete a model of the infinite is of the same order of piquancy as the performance of a man who, to use Wittenstein's example, should breathlessly burst into a room pa- panting, Minus four, minus three, minus two, minus one. I've done it. I've recited the negative numbers, right? Um, so, yeah, so, so basically what he's saying is that, you know, it's kind of like you can't count to infinity. You can't, if the universe is infinite, construct a model of it because it's infinite. You can't construct an infinite model. And so the joke that Wittgenstein here says, uh, Wittgenstein, who cares how you say his name, but the, the example he says is that if you're like, like you can't count down all the negative numbers, right? Because there's, there's infinite number of negative numbers, right? Uh, you know, like, obviously, between minus 3 and minus 2 is minus uh, uh, 2.5. <laughs> Sorry, I'm sick, okay? I'm sick. I, it's like, whatever. Uh, uh, anyway, in order that a situation could be coherently described as the causing or the causelessness of the world, it would have to be a situation in which the world could be placed. But any situation can be a situation which is part of the world. The world cannot have no outside, and as it can have no outside, it can have no cause. There can, therefore, be no material grounds on which the adjective cause and uncaused or finite and infinite can be descriptively applied to the universe. No empirical discourse can logically constitute the material grounds of any of the epithets. It is only left that there should be postulates, right? So you guys get that. Uh, you know, I kind of just kind of read it a little bit, whatever, but you guys get it. Um, you know, it's like, like I said, it's not really this fundamental. Uh, it's more so just a flex, right? If, however, one postulates a cause for what there is, one is thereby committed to the conception of an outside and an inside of the world. This needs not lead to any irreducible contradiction, for whether the world is finite or infinite depends, as suggested earlier, upon the mode of conceiving the world. Hence, the opposition is strictly dialectical. Uh, beyond mere formal dialectics, uh, so, you know, dialectics, you know, is like opposing parts and so on and so forth, right? Uh, beyond mere formal dialectics, however, one significance of the cosmic contrast of the inside and outside of the world is that it implies an acknowledgement that there is a conversion of a process which commences outside the world into the world and its contents. It is therefore hardly surprising that in the Christian Bible, precisely this is held. There, God is cursed, converted to Adam through his living breath and second to Jesus Christ through a mystical, through a mystic incarnation. Appropriately, therefore, Christianity holds that we have our being in God in whom we live, right? All right. So, actually, this might have been important, right? But uh, let's see. I Hopefully, you guys get it, though. Uh, yeah, all right. So, this might be a little more complicated. So, I'll, I'll actually go over it a little bit just because I've, I've been told this is a complicated book and... And, you know, this is what it, we should do, right? So in order to the situation, so let's go back, let's go back to the page, whatever it was, uh, 11, right? And say, in order that a situation could be coherently described as a causing or the cause, because the, the, the trouble right here is that he uses the word world. Uh, so he went from the universe to the world, and I'm not really sure if he means earth or the universe still, right? So let's just, let's just clarify that, right? So in order that a situation could be coherently described as the causing or the causelessness of the world, right? It would have to be a situation in which the world could be placed, right? So what cause, so, all right, so a situation, so we're going to the whole water thing, right? Going to the whole water thing or the spirits and ideas of spirits, right? He's like, if this situation, if that thing, right, whatever you think is the fundamental product of the world, right, if that's described as causing or the causes of the world, then it would have to be a situation in which the world could be placed, right uh 
But any situation can only be a situation which is part of the world. The world can have no outside. Uh, therefore, it can have no outside. It can have no cause, right? If the world has no outside, then it, if the world has nothing outside of itself, or the universe has nothing outside of itself, then it can't have any cause because there's nothing outside it to cause it. Uh, there can, therefore, be no material grounds on which the adjective cause on cause or finite and infinite can be descriptively applied to the universe. No empirical discourse can logically constitute the material grounds on any of the epithets. It is only left that there should be postulates. And, and, and this is actually pretty important. So what he's saying is that, look, you can't say that there's something outside of the universe that caused the universe, right? Because now you come back to, well, wasn't that a part of the universe? Like, like what, what was that a part of? You know what I mean? Like, what, what was that thing that was outside of the universe? And why is it outside of the universe? Like, what is going on? You know what I'm saying? And, and why do we put the... Or like, but of course, you know, I don't even think this is a fair thing to say in the sense of, uh, if we're being honest... The, the universe, if it is a finite space, right, you could definitely have something outside the universe that's not also the universe. But, of course, that's where the trouble comes when, when what is it that you define as the universe, right? Is it everything? And if it's everything, then obviously you won't have anything outside of everything, right? But if it's really just the uh, finite space in which we as human beings and everything that we observe is within then there could be things that we don't observe that's without, obviously. Uh, anyway, if, however, one postulates a cause for what there is, one is thereby committed to the conception of an outside and an inside of the world. This needs not lead to any reducible contradiction for whether the world is finite or infinite depends, as suggested earlier, upon the mode of conceiving the world. Hence, the opposition is strictly dialectical. So he's saying, again, you know, uh, you know the, the finitude and the infinitude of, of, of the world really only depends upon whether or not it had a beginning. Uh, because something that has a beginning is finite, and something that uh, does not have a beginning is infinite. But whether or not something is outside or inside, uh, uh, yeah, that, that's a whole other uh, conversation, right? So he says, hence the thing is strictly dialectical. I do want to look up the word dialectical uh, just for... Oh, wait, what? Oh, wait. Okay, so, there, so there's something that says pantheism versus panentheism. Panentheism, whatever that is. It's just a... Uh, that's present in the world. Panentheism identifies the identity and significance of the non-divine. Uh, let me see what panentheism is. So, sorry, it's just a... Like, you know you know how Google Google be like, yo, did you mean panentheism? And you're like, what? Uh, did you mean to search panentheism versus panentheism? It's like, No. <laughs> but I'll look into it. Let me not do that right now, though. Uh, what was I trying to look up? Oh, yeah, dialectical. And this is just, you know, like I, I'm familiar with it. Uh, relating to the logical discussion of ideas and opinions or concerned with and acting through opposing forces. So, you know, just to clarify for people who might be listening, like, what does this mean? So it's like, has the opposition is strictly dialectical or has the opposition is strictly just dealing with opposing uh, forces? You know, uh, or strictly just dealing with the logical discussion, you know, and not really have anything to do with anything, right? So beyond mere formal dialectics, however, one significance of the cosmic contrast of the inside and outside, right? So beyond being just talking about opposites, you know, inside is opposite of the outside, right? Uh, so beyond that of the world, it is that it implies an acknowledgement that there is a conversion of a process which commences outside the world into the world and its contents. It is therefore hardly surprising. So he's like, yeah, even though we might say this is just inside, inside, we're also saying, hey, look, something outside made the inside, right? And so the examples here, he's like, in the Christian Bible, you have that, you know, Adam doesn't create Adam, right? Humans don't create humans, but instead their God, you know, the Wazungu God creates the, the humans, right? Now, obviously... This is, you know, like, again, like a scientific perspective would be that humans do come from uh, earlier hominids, right? And not this story, right? But whatever. And the other one, of course, is just Jesus, Jesus, Jesus who comes through, comes about through some, I guess, it's like some angel or something like that, right? But anyway, so probably, therefore, Christianity holds that we have our being in God in whom we live. So, again, 
that's obviously Christianity. But especially when this conversion is thought to be reversible, a definite contradiction is created in society, the contradiction between interests inside the world and interests outside the world. This kind of contradiction... So wait, let me see. I'm going to try to be careful because, again, like I said, this book uh, is I'm told it's complicated. So, you know, you don't want to just... Right? You want to read it carefully so that people can follow along. It's not that important right now, uh, but it's like... I want you to get the book. Like, I want you to understand the book so that um, going forward, we don't have to, uh, like, you don't have to be like, well, I should read it myself because I don't understand what he was, you know, like, I, like, I'm like i being thorough, okay? So, but especially when this conversion is thought to be reversible, a definite contradiction is created in society. The contradiction between interests inside the world and interests outside the world. This kind of contradiction is made articulate in religion. In Christianity, for example, we are enjoined to lay up treasures in heaven where moths do not corrupt. We are also assured by St. Augustine that though we are in the world, we are not of it, being wayfarers. So he's like, you know, you might have this God creates man, but then man can now become a part of God's kingdom, right? That's the reversible of it. Like, and you know, you hear this from a lot of people, a lot of people articulate this idea of, well, we are not, we're not physical, like we're spiritual beings in a physical body, as opposed to, uh, or we're, I think it was like the other one was like physical, no, 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 but I think that's the one. Yeah, so spiritual beings in a physical body, and so it's like, you know, we're just wayfarers, and you kind of see, it's like St. Augustine says the same damn thing, uh, but you know, it's just putting this humans as the part of the divine and you will actually if you pick up this other book one of the books I'm trying to read again like I told you was Marcus Garvey's Philosophy's Opinions Volume 3 like he's really about that too like you know uh, man I don't know if it's him alone I think I remember some Europeans saying the same thing but this idea that you know, g- g- you know their God is a creator and therefore man should create as well because he is a creation of the creator and the creator wants you to be like him. You know, you're creating the image of God and God is a creator. And so therefore, you know, blah, 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 blah. So it's like, like, again, now I, I say Wazungu God, right? Because this is really just Wazungu theology. This is just European theology. You might find something similar in African, uh, diff- African religious discourses or spiritual discourses. So you might be like, well, I don't see why it's blah, blah, blah. But you know, at some point, you do want to give Wazungu their credit. Or, or you do want to acknowledge that Wazungu... Like, this is just really like a thought experiment coming out of Europe. Um, now, if now we do have our own separate thought experiments coming out of Africa, and but this is not an evaluation of those. Like I said, you want to go by the subconscious. When you talk about subconscious, although St. Augustine was in Algeria, I believe, right? Which is a country in Africa, right? Um... You, you you do want to acknowledge that, you know, this Christianity talk, this Jesus Christ talk, this, you know, uh, Hobbes and Plato and all that kind of thing. Well, not Plato, but yeah, but Hobbes and, uh, and this and so forth. You realize that you're talking about uh, 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 a one single thing. Um, and and, the, and the, uh, all of this really, if I'm being serious, if I'm being honest, all of this is kind of ridiculous. You know, you don't have to anthropomor- anthropomorphize um, the creation of the universe like, it really doesn't make much sense to anthropomorphize the creation of the universe. And this is why I kind of want to write a metaphysics book, because, you know, you know, as much as I do like and appreciate Garvey for saying, you know, you know, God created, and therefore, you know, we have to create in God's image. You know, humans didn't exist for a good 14 billion years. You know, so it's really kind of weird to be like, yeah, you know, this universe was created by uh, some entity that was like humans, even though there were no humans for a good 14 billion years. Or or, or even more realistically speaking, there were other intelligent life forms much before us and their galaxies were vaporized. You know, because we are not even the first generation of galaxies. If you understand that we are a part of stardust. We're made of stardust of earlier stars that were destroyed and earlier planets that were destroyed. So it's really... Uh, you know, like the, the, the you know, to, to give humans this great divine purpose and this great right point is really not something I would personally do, you know. But of course, I would rather write a metaphysics book on that because, you know, as much as I, I told you I'm a Garveyite, you know, I don't necessarily agree with this anthropomorphizing of history because one of the things that you'll pick up in Garvey as well as in Wazumbu's culture 
is that because we are these divine things and because we're the creators and because like we're the masters of the universe and the universe is for us to conquer and con you know and it's like I'm not necessarily against conquest but I'm not going to articulate it and rationalize it based off of this false premise of of a anthropomorphized uh, 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 thing so that's why I would say it's a wazungu thing you know because what these ideas are for really is for conquering other people and destroying the freaking planet you know and I'm really like you know I'm a climate change wise but again you're not really interested in hearing from me you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean you if you are you know I, I mean maybe you are I mean like like I'm not gonna trip you listen to a video that I that I made you probably are interested, right but if you are, like I said, you got to go check out the Book of Power, okay? The Book of Power has this stuff. Not not this stuff, per se. I'm going to write another book, okay? I'm going to write another book. Hopefully, it's going to have some uh, metaphysics in it because I, I really, like, like I said, I'm reading this Garvey book, and I'm like, damn it, bruh. Like, like this this Christianity stuff, right? You know what I mean? But, uh, and he's really, like, Garvey's really going in, like, yeah, we got to conquer the world. The world is ours, and blah, blah. And that's, like, from the Adam and Eve story, you know? Adam is told, hey, this world is for you. Everything here is for you, you know? And that's the kind of belief that Wazungu takes to colonize the freaking planet uh, uh, or to, you know, destroy the planet as they are doing now, you know, which is, uh, which is like a horrible thing. So, you know, again, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not, it's not exactly uh, what I was, uh, what, what I, what I, what I want to do. So uh, let's get you on that. So the contradiction takes effect when this, uh, so the, uh, yeah, I just want to give you some context as to. Yeah, this might sound good, or, or even why I'm saying white, the white God, because this is not really, uh, you know, African theology. This is not really African philosophy. This is really Wazungu philosophy, and it's not reality. It's just white people thinking that they are the superior beings, and this is, this is how they rationalize their quote-unquote superiority by saying that they are close to the people who created the freaking universe, which or that they're related somehow or are akin or alike somehow to the people who created the universe, or no, sorry, to the entity that might have created the universe. But of course, there's no evidence of this entity that created the universe. And notwithstanding that, there's no there's no real rational reason to assume that the creation of the universe is uh, somehow related to humans. You know, who came about 14 billion years later. You know, it's just, it's just not really too rational to say that. Yeah, because like, why would they come fourteen billion years later on a like a third or fourth generation star, solar system, right? Why would they come fourteen billion years later? Like that, this, this is not adding up. You know, it'd be different if it was like the universe was like two thousand years old. You know, as the Bible actually rationalizes, right? But that that would make a lot more sense. That oh yeah, it's focused on humans. But if you when you look at it like, hey, actually, humans weren't even like. Like, humans came about through an evolutionary process, you know? And they are just as evolved as the gorillas and the roaches and the dinosaurs. and what, You know, like, 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 what was the purpose of the dinosaurs, you know? Like, 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 what was the purpose of the freaking solar system before us? Like, what, like, like, we're made out of stardust, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, what was the purpose of that? Of, of, of all the galaxies just so that freaking humans... We, no, it's like it's just too like I don't like the anthropomorphized thing, so you know. But anyway, that's just it's just me. Uh, I just want to give you guys some context, okay? And I'm sick, so bear with me. <coughs> All right. So the contradiction takes effect when this when with the gaze steadfastly fixed upon things outside the world, the requirements of earthly life, which in fact conditions the existence of every human being, suffers neglect. The opposition, this opposition of interest, this social opposition between inside and outside is dialectical in nature and can be used to explain the course of many societies, including African societies. The course of such societies is determined by a seesaw, a contest between the inside and the outside, between the terms of uh, between the terms of the contradiction described above it is the recognition of this kind of contradiction that the use to which it might be put in the exploitation of the workers that impelled Marx to criticize religion as an instrument of exploitation because religion was used to divert the workers' attention from the value which they have created by their labor to outside concerns. So we're actually probably now finally getting into the meat and potatoes of the philosophy of, of decolonization. Basically, uh, this, this Marx is you know, criticizing religion because he's like, hey, look, that's just a distraction. Uh, from the reality that you're being exploited for your labor. Now, whether you're being exploited for your labor or not is also another conversation, but um, 
It is what it is. Many African societies, in fact, forestall this kind of perversion. The dialectic contradiction between the inside and outside was reduced by making the visible world continuous with the invisible world. For them, heaven was not outside the world, but inside it. These African societies did not accept transcendentalism and may indeed be regarded as having attempted to synthesize the dialectical opposites outside and inside by making them continuous, that is, by abolishing them. In present-day Africa, however, a recognition of the dialectical tradition... Uh, so, yeah, basically he's talking about, you know, different African societies. And notice he says many, not every, right? But many African societies did uh, see the visible world and the invisible world, right? The physical world and the metaphysical world, right? As just a continuum, okay? And, and, uh, and, and that's fine. Right? Uh, that's fine. So you say, in present-day Africa, however, a recognition of the dialectical contradiction between inside and outside has a great deal to contribute to the process of decolonization and development, for it helps us to anticipate a colonialist and imperialist devices... Uh, uh, sorry. For it helps us to anticipate colonialist and imperialist devices for furthering exploitation by diverting our energies from secular concerns. The recognition of the dialectical opposition is universally necessary. Right? Religion is an instrument of bourgeois social reaction, but its social use is not always confined to colonialists and imperialists. Its success in their hands can exercise a certain fascination on the minds of Africans who begin by being revolutionary but are, by, but are bewitched by any passing opportunities, chance to use religion to make political gains. Right? Seizing the slightest of these chances, they in fact take two steps backwards from the one step forward in order to enjoy a transitory consolidation, consolidation based on a common religious belief and practice. Okay, so this is actually pretty interesting. This is brother, there's a few people on Twitter who always get into religious debates all the time. And, you know, it's actually pretty interesting to see Kwame Nkrumah put his hat into the thing. He's like, look, religion. And he's talking about Abrahamic religions behind this, right? But religion is an instrument of bourgeois social reaction. Okay, but its social use is not always confined to colonists and imperialists. It's not, it's not just colonists and imperialists that use religion. Okay, its success in the hands can exercise a certain fascination on the minds of Africans who begin by being revolutionary. So he's like, there are some Africans who begin by being revolutionary, but they see an opportunity to make political gains by pursuing religion. Okay, like you, like, 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 like I, I broke it down when I was in Africa and I was in Ghana. I was like, look, like I'm in a, I'm in a, I'm in a little community with dirt roads, okay? And I asked one of these sisters, I said, hey, is your pastor rich? Because, you know, all pastors are rich, right? She goes, yeah, I don't know how, though, right? Uh, you know, because everybody's poor, but the pastor's rich. And it's like, look, if you do the tithing system, this is one of the, one of the things on the Book of Power, and even on this, uh, this pro-black perspective uh, podcast network, right? Uh, or podcast one of the one of the things that I point out is that when you tax people by ten percent, right? And you can just do the math, really. It's actually pretty basic math, right? You take thirty people, and you take ten percent of their income, you get three hundred percent of their average income, right? Ten percent is you know ten percent of of, of yeah you know, ten percent of multiple people is obviously the average of those multiple people, and you take thirty thirty times ten is three hundred three hundred percent that means three times. You get three times their average income by having 30 people. So basically what he's saying is that, you know, you can have a pretty good life if you are taxing people and giving them nothing in return. Right? Because if you tax 30 people and give them nothing in return, then you will get three times their average income doing nothing. Right? And that's what the opportunity is for even an African who might be like, hey, I don't like this system, but wait a moment. You're telling me I could just make a bunch of money and, 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 and get all the honeys and, 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 and you, know, you know. There's those videos of these guys who are like slapping women's butts, you know, as pastors. They're just slapping their butts. And these women are just like laying on the, on the floor like, oh, yes, he's going to slap my butt in the name of Jesus. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's you know, like, like there's, there's everybody knows about if you go down south in America, like the pastors messing with different people's da- like wives or daughters or, or sisters or what have you. Like, yeah, you, you, you can have, and it's not like necessarily a political game per se, but this is like, like realistically speaking, let's just, let's just say like what it is. It's an economic game. It's a cultural game. It's a societal game. You push that Christian narrative, it's, it, it helps you among people who were Christianized. Uh, I am still, even though I'm reading this Garvey book, where Garvey just seems like a freaking Christian, right? I'm still convinced, because I remember, I remember in his, his wife's book, Garvey and Garveyism, that she was like, yeah, he was like, it was, it was the most beneficial thing to do. People are just Christians, so you just say, yeah, I'm a Christian. 
you just part of you put forward the Christian the Christian faith. Because that's that's the most a political game thing. In fact, I'll, I'll be honest with you, Marcus Garvey is like, hey, to go against the church is stupid. It's like the best institution. He says it's like the best institution in uh in in, in the in the in the West. And and I mean I can't tell if he's being genuine or if he's just letting you know, hey, look, yeah, the church is a bad institution. But if you're looking to have some sort of favor among a bunch of Christianized people, then you got to use that for what it is. You understand? Like, 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 like it, it's, it's twofold. One of the best uh, uh, politicians in American history, uh, African, uh, the, the, uh, among the African Americans, is this guy named uh, Adam Clayton Powell Jr. He's actually mixed, but notwithstanding, he was a pastor. He was a pastor. You know, the, the reality is that if you, if, you know, here in Kuma, now look at Kuma, he's like, yeah, man, you know, this church is not really, you know, blah, blah, blah. And they're going to, they're going to kick him out. Now, obviously, this book is trying to synthesize and recognize this, you know, consciousism. Consciousism is about, you know, synthesizing the religion and so on and so forth. But again, you know, you, you know, I personally wouldn't do it, but I understand why Garvey did I personally wouldn't do it, but I understand why Garvey did because you have a people like I'm telling you, I was in Ghana, and these people are not religious scholars. Like the, like the kids I was talking to, like you know, 16, 17, you know, uh, like one of them, like two of them were like, I want to be soldiers, right? And the boy, uh, uh, one of the boys was like, uh, yeah, I want to fight the enemies of God. You know, he doesn't know the Bible, but he wants to he wants to fight the enemies of God. Like like you have people who are loyal. Like I asked them because you know on social media they say. Black people fight for their religion. And you're like, oh, would you fight for your religion? I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll kill somebody for this religion. You know, like, like this is this is uh, the 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 world you're in, right? So yeah, you know, you might be like like Kwame Nkrumah says, hey, you know, you might be a revolutionary, uh, but then you're like, wait a second, this is a this is an opportunity for me to live well. Because remember, at the end of the day, you do want to live well. You do want your children to eat well, and if you can get that, however you get that, a lot of people will go for it. You know, you, you could be idealistic and be like, hey, you know what? I want to fight for a better life. You know, sure, you could be that way. But a lot of people are not going to be you. And, and let's be realistic. Some of you who are listening, who are like, yeah, I'm about the revolution. Like, what are you doing right now? Like, like why are you not listening to my live? You know, it's my live because you was at work. You were at work or you were at church or something, but you were at work. Or are you working on work or so so like basically what I'm saying is that you might say that you not about to finna do nothing for the system, you might not see be about no economic gain or political gain, but you clearly are. A lot of people are listening. Some people maybe not, but a lot of people listening, you know what you is, right? So anyway, since the slightest uh seeing the sizeless slightest of these chances, they in fact take two steps backwards for the one step forward in order to enjoy a, a transitory consolidation based on a common religious belief and practice. This idiosyncratic tactic can only create more problems than it promises to solve. Now, again, you're not worried about creating problems. Like, again, you working wherever you working, whether you push in a broom or whatever, you creating more problems too. You're not, you're not solving nothing. Whenever you go to the white boy, whenever you clock in with the white boy, you're not solving anything. You know what I'm saying? You know, you can't be like, hey, man, this pastor, he's not solving anything. Yeah, of course he's not solving. Nobody's solving anything. Or oh, few people are solving anything, and, 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 and when they are solving stuff, are, are, you, are, you are, you getting, are you getting this stuff? You know, like like I like I said with this Kwame Nkrumah, like few people in Ghana read Kwame Nkrumah. You know what I'm saying? And this this brother's this brother started a nation. All right, so this is it's just kind of, so yeah. So for certain, it will check the advancing social consciousness of the people. Besides, in the long run, a dialectical opposition between church and state will be recreated through what begins by be being a tactical move, becoming entrenched. This idiosyncratic tactic actively encourages religious forms and practices as well as religious ideology. When the relative political consolidation aimed at is achieved, the tactic is dropped, but the religious revivalism, which it has fomented and exploited, cannot be so easily checked. It is essential to emphasize that the historical condition of Africa it is essential to emphasize in the historical condition of Africa that the state must be secular. So, again, you know, what's interesting is this. Actually, this is, pretty, this is actually twofold interesting. So, like I said, you can learn from anybody. You can learn from a fool. Okay? You can learn from a fool. If you, if you go back, read Patahotep. One of the first things Patahotep says, he's giving advice 
he's like, hey, this is the advice of the lifetime. And Patanotep was a free African. So you really want to check him out, right? Patanotep says, you can learn from a sage as well as an idiot, right? And I say this to say that I opened up a video by that guy. Um, I can't remember his name, but he's like this dummy. Since I'm not going to say his name, I might as well diss him. But he's like some dummy who's like, African American, like they're Americans, or African Americans are indigenous to America, you know, and all that kind of stuff, right? He's like one of those dummy. I can't remember his name, but he's pretty popular. Uh, he does this video where he's like, "Look, man, you know, every nation was formed was was a religious formation, you know, and it's not necessarily true, true, but America was religious colonies. They were Christian colonies. They were the, the charters and all that kind of stuff were about." you know, establishing a Christian nation, you know? Uh, even if you look into what, what, what is uh, Judaism, it is about forming a religious country. Like, the whole premise is, let's form a religious nation. Um, either way, that's what America was. Uh, I'm not going to say that every nation was a religious thing. That's not necessarily the case, but that's what it is. The idea is that if you're following the American model and you're saying, hey, I want to be a secular state, uh, that's not what America... America's not really a secular state. When America, when it says freedom of religion... It's really like freedom to be a Christian, a Muslim, or a Jew. And even then, it's like, maybe not a Muslim, maybe not a Jew. You know, in some cases, it's like, yeah, maybe not. But, like, freedom to be any type of Christianity, uh, with the exception of Catholicism. Because they, it's really just like Protestant, uh, Protestant colonies, right? Either way, like, you're not, you're not going to be Bombada, you're not going to be Zulu, you're not going to, you know, you're, like, you're going to be, you know, you're Luo, you're not going to, you know, whatever. You're going to be... You know, oh, well, this is a, you know, agnostic church or so. Well, not agnostic church. I don't know the names of the church. I don't know the names, but you get what I'm saying. Uh, there's a Mormons or whatever, right? Uh, yeah, so now here Kwame Nkrumah is coming along like, well, you got to be secular, right? We got to follow what the Americans doing and be secular. But the Americans are not secular. Like, like, like legit, you're in the school system, the public school system, and you're like, I pledge allegiance to the flag. You know what I mean? Like you're doing all that. You know, you got the dollar bill, which is like in the back. It's like in God we trust. You know, you got the you got the you got the uh, the, the you know Bush or Biden or whatever. Like, uh, you know, who are like, yeah, man, you know, in one nation, hundred, you know, like all that kind of stuff. So it's uh, not a secular country, but you're trying to establish a secular country, right? Uh, technically, you know, technically, again, it's like it's a really complicated thing. It's a very complicated thing because. You want an ethical foundation, and that ethical foundation is very likely going to come from uh, some sort of a spiritual or religious belief. You know, uh, an ethical foundation purely secular uh, might make some sense, but it really speaks towards what is the objective, what is an objective morality, right? Because morality is subjective, you know? The, the, you know, one of the things that, like I said, I used to approach the morality question pretty deeply. So one of the things I want to point out for you is that, like, the lion is ethical and the gazelle is ethical. But the lion eats the gazelle. You know? Uh, and, and the gazelle runs away from the lion. As I say that, sometimes ethics is just subjective. And so even if you were to go into another circumstance, which is the more realistic circumstance of, well, agriculturalist cultures, and I talk about this a lot. Uh, when I talk about economics, economics, agricultural cultures, industrial cultures, and uh, hunter-gatherer cultures, and uh, uh, and uh, herding cultures, or nomadic cultures, right? All of them have their own ethical background, like their own ethics, their own subjective ethics. You know, for the herder, for instance, he he or she requires their animals to have grazing land, right? Uh, for the agriculturalists, however, they require that their uh, their crops are unmolested by animals, right? Now, what happens if, if now this is what's happening in northern Nigeria, but what happens in northern Nigeria is that you have the Fulani who have, who are herding, about their herding, their herding uh, ethic. And then you have the Yoruba or the Igbo or whatever, they have the agricultural ethic. And then you have a lake that is drying up. And water and the desert is expanding because of climate change. And what happens is that now the land, the grazing land in the Fulani is being minimized by the industrialists out in the West, if you will. But 
what happens is now now they have their animals eating the Yoruba's uh, the Yoruba or the uh, so on and so forth uh, land. And what happens is that now you have a conflict that has no real ethical objectivity, because subjectively the uh, the herder has to care for their animals and their livestock, right? And they have to feed their animals and their livestock. And subjectively, the the agriculturalist has to uh, has to care about their agriculture, their farm products, their farm produce, because they have to sell it to the market, they have to eat, they have to so on and so forth, and both of their livelihood is threatened by the conflict of interest, particularly because the lake that might have had more arable land uh, outside of these uh, these uh, these village centers or what have you is drying up. And so you're going to have ethics going to be subjective. So when you even say a secular state, you know, like a secular state, what does that mean? Does that mean like because like, you can have a state that's a bunch of herders. Or you can have a state that's a bunch of agriculturalists. Or you can have a state that's a bunch of industrialists. And each of these has a different ethical foundation. You know, the industrialist, for instance, is going to come to uh, a land and say, hey, you know what? This farm that, like, they might go to the agriculturalist. Or they might go to the hunter. And they say, hey, your hunting grounds are next to a mine. Get the fuck out of here. And chase all the animals away. Right? We need to have industry near these mines. Or even, like, the farmer. Like, oh, well, you're, you know, you, you, on the other hand, you have to raise these crops that we want to send to be manufactured in Europe. You know, so we want coffee beans. We want this. We want that. And so their ethical framework is that, yeah, you might be feeding yourself. You might have all this land to feed yourself, but we want to use this land to produce products that can be sold and then we can get a lot of wealth. And so, you know, again, secularism does not necessarily entail uh, an ethical framework, per se. Now, religion, on the other hand, it is also outdated, I should tell you. So it is not necessarily the ethical framework. It's an anethical framework uh, for a particular ethical uh, arrangement, right? In the example of, uh, of the Abrahamic faiths, and I know I'm just going on a tangent right now, but the example of the Abrahamic faiths, they're talking about uh, a, a nomadic people who are uh, conquering agriculturalist people, right? So, so the religion, uh, so the religions that we are typically uh, look to for our ethical framework are religions that endorse slavery, are religions that endorse colonization, are religions that endorse so on and so forth. But they have an ethical framework, which is, hey, you know, you should not kill people who are your own people. Or if you're going to, or like for instance, when it comes to uh, the uh, the Judaic one, it's like you cannot lend people money within your own group or you cannot uh uh you know find meat off the floor and give it to people in your own group but you can sell it to people outside of your group so there is an ethics there's a warship right and all that kind of stuff but the point being that you know the, the the main the main jab here is that you can't just say you want a secular state per se right uh you have to realize that fundamentally uh, fundamentally, you do uh, have this this notion of uh, spiritual or religious uh, uh, or moral instructions that are not actually as objective as the word secular lends it to be, right? Because realistically speaking, for instance, what what Marx or Nkrumah are discussing is an industrial nation and an industrial ethic, and and their their and, and what that would mean, uh, what that would mean for the people who are not industrialists is something that they would naturally uh, be opposed to. Because, again, you know, the world is just about economics, really, and the conflict of economics in that sense, right? But that was just a slight tangent. I hope you guys can still hear me. Um, I want to see if I can turn this thing up. Is this going to make me louder or not? I don't know. I can't, I can't tell, so I'm just going to leave it alone right now. All right, so insistence of the secular nature of the state is not to be interpreted as a political declaration of a war on religion, for religion is also a social fact and must be understood before it can be tackled. To declare a political war on religion is to treat it as an ideal phenomenon, to suppose that it might be wished away, uh, to treat it as an ideal phenomenon, to suppose that it might be wished away, or at worst, scared out of existence. The indispensable starting point is to appreciate the sociological connection between religious belief and practice on the one hand, and the poverty on the other. People who are not aggressively religious are the poor people. 
people who are most aggressively religious, sorry, are the poorer people. For in accordance with the Marxist analysis, religion is social, contemporary religious forms and practices have their main root in the social depression of workers. Quick confirmation can be found in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and among the people of African descendant in America and the Caribbean. Uh, look, he's talking about the diaspora. Woo, woo, woo. All right. <laughs> uh, no, but it's just like, yo, you guys are religious, right? <laughs> anyway. Uh, terrifying pauperism arising from the pre-technical nature of most contemporary societies combined with the encroachment of world capitalism, a combination which can mete out prostitution, destruction, ruin, and death from starvation exploitation to its victims quickly reinforces the religious feeling. Fear created the gods and fear preserves them. Fear in bygone ages of wars, pestilence, earthquakes, and nature gone berserk. Fear of acts of God, fear today of the equally blind forces of backwardness and rapacious capital. So, um, let's just see what this, uh, what this is about. He's like, yeah, we're not going to fight against religion. We can't get rid of religion. Okay? Religion is actually pretty freaking popular among poorer people uh, because of whatever reason, right? Now, I don't necessarily believe that is the case, but again, when he says pre-technical nature of most contemporary societies, basically what pre-technical nature means, and sorry, my heat is like really loud, so I'm trying to speak a little louder, but what pre-technical nature means is, is in essence that, it's like they're not industrial, pre-industrial, in a sense, right? So agricultural economies, uh, you know, this kind of economy, that kind of economy. Um, it is worthwhile to try to understand why Christianity is popular among uh, poor people, but I, I couldn't necessarily, uh, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't even, like I, I could probably talk about it, but it's not even, like it's not really that important, you know. Just, like I usually wouldn't uphold this kind of view, but it's like a whole separate conversation, you know. I, I tend to, yeah, it's like it's just a whole separate conversation. All right, so answer to this question, what there is can be said to be idealist or materialist. Inasmuch, however, as an empiricist philosophy can be idealist, even though a materialist philosophy cannot be rationalist, the opposition between idealism and materialism cannot be made identical with the opposition between rationalism and empiricism. So now we're going to go into this. Rationalism is a philosophy breed, a philosophical breed imbued with certain distinctive characters. It is, in, in it, an explanation is conceived in such a way that the explanation must create a logical inference to the which it is explained. Empiricism. All right, sorry. Let's just. Sorry, this heat is like mad distracting, right? But it's good because I'm sick, so it's good, right? So rationalism is a philosophical breed imbued with certain distinctive characters. In it, an explanation is conceived in such a way that the explanation must create a logical inference to that which is explained, right? So. Rationalism is just a philosophical school where you're rationalizing things, right? Empiricism, on the other hand, has no such inference to offer. If one kind of event is regularly and invariably followed by another kind, empiricism accepts the first kind of event as explaining the second kind, right? So he's like, look, the cause, like, you know, like every time somebody punches you in the face, right, your face hurts, okay? That's your empirical. That's empiricism. Now, is that the, the, the rationalization? You, know, you might be like, hey, my face hurts because of the nerves in my face. And they are irritated and agitated and they were accelerated by a punch to the face. Who knows, right? But the empiricism is saying, look, one event happens, another event happens, that's what it is. Now, a lot of times, logically, you might say, and he's probably going to point this out, logically, you might say, look, uh, chronology is not proof of cause and effect. Right, but what he's saying is this: like you keep seeing the same thing over and over again. It's it's like like you know like kind of like the sunrise, you know, like you know the sun's gonna rise. Why? Because you've seen the sunrise for how many years you've been on the earth. You know what I mean? Uh, sorry, if one kind of event is so rationalism cannot because the succession of events is not a necessary. Yeah. Uh, so if one kind of uh, assess the first kind as explaining the second kind, but rationalism cannot. Because this succession of events is not a necessary one. There is no logical inference from the occurrence of one kind of event to the occurrence of another kind of event. So he's like, yeah, you know, like, like I just said, you know, that's not proof of cause and effect. Indeed, David Hume is celebrated mainly for establishing the empiricist position, and it is for this reason that rationalists are convinced that Hume was ignorant of the real nature of an explanation. So basically, David Hume was somebody who was about empiricism, and it's like, rationalist people are like, yeah, that's stupid, that's not how you explain things, right? So rationalism and empiricism also vary over the avenues to knowledge. 
according to the former, I hope you guys can hear me. Like, I'm pretty mad that this mic thing is not working. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up the mic now. Hopefully you guys could. I'm going to put it closer to my face. And hopefully you didn't miss out too much before. All right. I kind of want to go turn off my heat, but I'm not going to do it. All right. Rationalism and empiricism also vary over the avenues to knowledge. According to the former, a set of procedures or tasks can constitute a method of obtaining knowledge only if provided the task has been correctly performed. Sorry, I'm just like mad distracted. Uh, I'm just mad distracted. I'm like just doing mental math. I'm like, how can I get this thing to quiet down? It's supposed to quiet down. I don't know if you guys can hear it, though, but it's like super loud for me. All right. And if you can hear it, you're just like, yeah, we can hear it. But, you know, I, I can't like I'm doing this not live. So I can't really get feedback. I just have to think about feedback. All right. So rationalism and empiricism, empirically, right? <laughs> I think about feedback empirically. Okay. Tough crowd. All right. Rationalism and empiricism also vary over the avenues to knowledge. According to the former, a set of procedures or tasks. So a former, obviously, according to rationalism, a set of procedures or tasks can constitute a method of obtaining knowledge only if, provided the task has been correctly performed, desired knowledge must infallibly be obtained. So only infallibly like if cause makes effect and it's isolated all that kind of stuff only then could you be like yes that's what happened here a fruitful comparison can be made with the method of addition the method of addition imposes certain tasks upon us these tasks require the digit be added up from the unit column through the tens column to the final uh column and if those tasks are correctly performed the correctness of the emergent total is guaranteed the method of addition is thus seen to fulfill rationalism's specification for method right so 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 he's like yeah you rationalism and addition they like the, like addition is the one like an example of rationalism okay so according to empiricism however a method need not guarantee its own infallible success and one finds john stuart mill saying that induction notwithstanding is being a valid method of obtaining truth is still fallible for rationalism, a valid but fallible procedure is a logical howler. So he's just showing you his breath again, like John Mills. Now, actually, this is actually a pretty interesting discussion because what happens is this. Sometimes people will say, like, like I remember having this debate on Twitter, right? So make sure you guys follow my Twitter. It's at Onitase, O-N-I-T-A-S-E-T. -E you can like, obviously look at the title. But um, I have this debate, and it's like, you're like, hey, man, Christianity makes black people docile. And people are like, no, it doesn't make us docile. And there, what happens is that, and they're like, that's because you, you have Nat Turner, and you have uh, Malcolm X, and you have uh, uh, Marcus Garvey, and you have blah, blah, blah. You know, you're like, oh, okay, right? And so that's pretty much a rationalist argument against an empirical argument. So the empirical argument is saying, look, it's not that it has to have infallible success. It's that, and so, I'm, so I'm giving you guys some game. I'm giving you some game, right? It's that, hey, this usually happens, Right? This usually happens, and, and that's the whole reason. You know, if you guys know, make sure you guys check out Revolutionary Matron. But, you know, I was on a program the other day, and we were going over Code Noir. And Code Noir was uh, white folk, uh, you know, the white, you know, king of England, of France. Like, hey, we got to give these Negroes slavery, and we got to give these Negroes Christianity so that they are good slaves, you know? And so, you know, for us, you know, today, be like, hey, you know what? That's not the case. You know, Christianity doesn't make people good slaves because, look, Nat Turner wasn't a good slave. It's like, no, that's not how it worked. If you if you if you understand Nat Turner's existence, he was. And yeah, the heat came off, so I probably put on the mic again. But if you if you if you understand uh, Nat Turner's existence, he was like, hey, how can I find people to work with because I'm surrounded by a bunch of these mother, you know, I'm surrounded by a bunch of cowards, you know. Uh, either way. Uh, yeah, so like I said, it's like it's like the difference between a rationalist and an empirical argument. So the, the rational argument is that, hey, because everybody's not Christian, you can't say, I mean, everybody's not docile, you can't say Christianity leads to docility. But on the other, on the empirical side, you're like, hey, it's empirically proven that, you know, they gave us religion to freaking make us docile. You know? I don't know if you guys heard that weird scream, but, you know, there's a weird scream going on. All right, um... But yeah, that's uh that's actually pretty pretty like it's pretty good for my diction going forward, so that I could sound like a smart guy, uh, you know, because that's what I want to do. Right? No, I'm joking. Um. Okay, logical howler. So I don't know the word howler, but I don't really care. I don't think it's that important. So finally, rationalism holds that there are some ideas in the human mind which are innate to it. 
That is to say, these ideas have not entered the minds of outside and moreover could not do so. Uh, in pr practice, rationalists do not agree over the precise catalog of such ideas, though they tend to agree that the idea of God is a shining example. Uh, so that's actually pretty interesting. So I don't believe that this idea of God is a shining example, but, you know, like, like again, he says they tend to agree. Like, he's familiar with the literature, and of course he's talking about why so goes so and so forth. I did observe, though, as a Baba, I did observe my baby being born, coming out of his mother's uterus, and then climbing on her stomach to go to her breasts and drink the milk, right? It's like, you know, and when, and you know, this is one of the most fascinating things about not just the human experience, but like the animal experience in general, where like even turtles will be born somewhere randomly and then they would walk towards the ocean. Now, what makes something walk towards the ocean? What makes a baby crawl towards the breast? You could, you could theorize, maybe it's their sense of smell. Maybe the aroma of the milk or the breasts is actually pleasing and drawing to a child. Who knows, right? Maybe the, the smell of the ocean is drawing. I don't know. You would probably do an experiment. You could do an experiment of, you know, uh, of, of, you know, blind, like, you know, covering the nose, covering the eyes. Who knows, right? Or, or sealing, the, sealing the room, you know? Um, whatever it is. And it's the same with uh, one of the things that I really found fascinating, too, was uh, of, of plants that just bend, you know, you can't see me bending, but they bend toward the outside, right? Um,
Can you guys hear me? Damn, could you guys have heard me? I don't even know if you guys heard me just now. Okay. I wonder if it was damn. I just saw my my thing wasn't plugged in, so I don't know if you guys heard me just now. So I can't even uh, say. Damn, that sucks because I was really going in about ancient Egyptians and Greeks. But maybe you heard me, so I'm just gonna go by. Maybe possibly you heard me. Um. Anyway, so uh, the ancient Greeks, Egyptians and the ancient Greeks, uh, they, uh, damn, I don't even know if you guys heard me. <laughs> Oh, this is bad. All right. Um, ancient Egyptians, ancient Greeks. Uh, yeah, so, so basically, if you guys didn't hear, I said that uh, the ancient Egyptians... So Libnes uh, comes from this uh, school of thought, um, like from calculus, like like they, they, they attribute them with calculus. And what happens in that description is that calculus is now... Whether that resulted from... Oh, Newton and, and Leibniz kind of derive it the same uh, like parallel. But if you look at my website, you'll find that I talk about, uh, I show you a document where Newton is talking about Tahuti. And in so much as he's talking about Tahuti, he's going through the ancient African literature and he's pointing out how Africa can be, uh, like how, no, no, he's pointing out how like African knowledge. And so I said, like when I studied cosmology, uh, I also heard, um, like I heard the the, the Wazungu teacher talking about how the Greeks formed their astronomical knowledge based off of the astronomical records of the ancient Egyptians, which happened to go back nine thousand or thirteen thousand years, right? And because it went back thirteen thousand years, they had their star charts thirteen thousand years. The Greeks would then, uh, you know, take credit for formulating some, like 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 today we give credit to the Greeks for them formulating the patterns of the cyclical nature of the stars and so on and so forth. Uh, but it might be that they actually got it from the uh, ancient Africans. But if now, here's where I come back to modern times, that, or, or to where I left off, which is that the Greeks themselves um, would refer to the African schools as mystery schools, right? As to say that one of the things about the ancient African schools was that you were not supposed to, well, in ancient, sorry, for the ancient Africans, they were not supposed to talk about what they learned. And so one of the things that the Greeks did was they broke that tradition by talking about and writing about the things that they learned in these African schools. And of course, this now, you know, creates the quote unquote intellectual tradition that forms, you know, this you know, modern society that we have today that would have been more exclusively limited to the upper class of ancient Kemet of which we probably wouldn't have been a part of, or we would have, who knows, but the point is, but, but definitely not the Europeans. Um, and of course, you know, if for those of you who are familiar with my literature, you'll know the reason why that was the case, why they had secret societies and secret knowledge is because they had these Wazungu people in their societies. Whereas in the Kenesu model, which I talk about in the Book of Power, in the Kenesu model, that knowledge would be more widespread and less uh, exclusive because they were all African people. Uh, so that's also another thing to, uh, to understand about uh, secret societies and all that kind of stuff. I hope you guys didn't miss too much, or if you, if you missed anything at all, because that's, that's going to be embarrassing. But, yeah, all right. So anyway, so, but now to the extent that the idealism makes the existence of matter dependent on perception or on the possession of ideas by the mind, I am sure that it can be refuted. On the normal sources of idealism, two can be discerned. On the other hand, idealism comes to solipsism, whether complete or incipient. On the other, it comes from some theory or other of perception. So, but now to the extent that idealism makes the existence of matter dependent on perception or on the possession of ideas by the mind, I am sure that it can be refuted. On the normal, on the normal sources of idealism, two can be discerned. On the one hand, idealism comes from solipsism, uh, whether complete or incipient, or the other, it comes from some theory or other of perception. Um, in complete solipsism, uh, the individual is identified with the universe. The universe comes to consist of the individual and his experience, and when we seek to inquire a little of what this gigantic individual who fills the universe is compounded, we are confronted with diverse degrees of incoherence. In solipsism, 
The individual starts from a depressing skepticism about the existence of other people and other things. On the group of his pessimism, he pleasantly ignores the fact that his own body is part of the external world, that he sees and touches his own body in exactly the same sense that he sees and touches any other body. If other bodies are only portions of the individual's experience, then by the same magic he must discarnate, discarnate himself. In this way, the individual's role as the center of solipsism begins to wobble seriously. He is no longer the peg on which the universe hangs, the hub around which it revolves. Solipsism begins to shed its focal point for the universe. The individual begins to coalesce with his own experience. The individual as a subject, the sufferer and enjoyer of experience, melts away, and we are left with unmatched, unattached experience. So, it's actually pretty cool. So basically, he's like, he's going over the different arguments of the world. He's like, hey, you know, there's solipsism, this idea that we are the identif identified with the universe ourselves. So that, you know, are you the center of the universe? You know, is only, like, am I a person or am I just a recording, you know, or I'm just a voice that's recording something for you, the listener, for your edification and that you really are the center of the universe and I don't really exist except for as something, as someone who's reading a book to you, right? Or is it the case that you don't exist and I am just reading, you know, this, this, this literature, this, this, this is recording and recording it and sending it out to the world and then looking at, you know, the 20, no, the, 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 the 60 views later on like, hey, you know what, I did that. No, obviously none of these are real and, and Kwame Nkrumah is going to go about it and say, look, we obviously have these bodies that are in, that interact with other bodies on equal level, you know, that we touch other bodies in exactly the same senses that other bodies touch us. And in fact, that if unless we are, in fact, not these bodies that we're walking around in, right, that that no, we are actually just part of this physical world and none of us are the center of the universe, obviously. I'm, and then, and, and in fact, I am a person as much as you are a person, and you're a person as much as I'm a person, and we're both doing different things, but at no way are we, are any of us really centered around the other individual, right? So that's pretty interesting. I probably might look up the word solipsism um, just for the fun of it. I kind of wish I ate before, but anyway. Uh, solipsism, the viewer theory that the self is all that can be known to exist, right? So, uh, yeah, so it's like this idea that only the self, only, and, and by the self, that's you, right? Sorry, in incipient solipsism, like that which afflicted Descartes, one encounters a form of argument which is, in its essence, sincerely fallacious. Descartes says that he can think of himself as being without eyes or as being without arms, etc. In short, he claims that he can think of himself as having been deprived of any of his physical features, which anyone might care to name. Whatever be the truth value of this, he sets it up as a reason for saying that he can think of himself as being without a body, though one may not wish to deny that Descartes could indeed have been physically deformed, indeed even hideously deformed. One must, I think, resolutely maintain that Descartes' incarnation is not a physical for deformity. There still remains a distinction between mere deformity and disincarnation. Descartes' reasoning is of the same level of speciousness as the notion that because one can think of a cow without a tail or horns, one can think of a cow without a body. Thinking of a cow without a body is as different from the thought of a cow without a tail as thinking of a Descartes without a body is different from his thought of himself without arms. Right. So, so basically, he's saying, look, a cow without a body is not a cow. You get that? A cow without a body is not a cow. Now, you could think of a cow lacking certain body parts, but to say that a cow has no body is not actually a cow. Why would it be a cow and not a lion, for instance? You understand? And so, of course, this kind of goes into the whole spirituality uh, conversation, and maybe he's going to go into that himself, but, you know, I just got to make sure my mic is plugged in because, like, part of me feels like it wasn't unplugged, but if it was, I'm just, like, kind of mad about that. Anyway, uh, my reason for referring to Cartesianism as incipient solipsism is that Descartes' alleged first principle is the admission of his own existence. On, his, on this sole first principle, he proposed quite unsoberly to hang the whole universe as well as God. I say that Cartesianism is incipient solipsism because it contains itself, inside itself, the seeds of a fully-fledged solipsism. 
These seeds can be seen to grow in the following way. Descartes proposes to doubt everything which might be known through the senses or through the reason. He sets out to doubt everything which might be known through the senses because the senses sometimes suffer from illusions and delusions, not to mention the fact that anything which is said to form part of a waking experience can equally well form part of a dream experience. After all, the objects and situations which dreams represent are not qualitatively different from the representation of sense. Since the sense can be... Uh, affected by illusion and delusion, he proposes to treat them as unreliable witnesses to truth. And as to the reason, through, uh, though as the best of times, he wishes to hold it to essentially infallible... Hold on a second, actually. I'm going to make a note. I'm going to make a note of <laughs> where I left off. Uh, so it's page 15. I'm going to have to make a note. I'm just going to make a note because if I can't be heard, I'm going to... I'm going to see where I wasn't heard, and then record that for the next podcast, because I'm probably going to release this podcast before you guys hear about it, um, so like, I, might, I might record the next chapter, chapter two, before you guys even hear chapter one, so just to let you know, if you missed out on something during chapter one, I could probably describe it in chapter two, right, so apologies for the unplugging, what happened was that when I moved my mic uh, in order to uh, think, I also, when I put it back down, I might have unplugged it a little bit. Now, I'm not 100% sure whether I plugged it or not, but I can't check that recording right now because it's recording right now. Um, so I'm just going to you know, finish this recording. And then if I, in fact, did miss out on some things, it was blank, then I'll just go over what was blank on uh, chapter two, right? Um, and then jump into chapter two, obviously. All right, so my re- reason for referring to Cartesianism, or maybe I could just put a separate... Uh, you know, like 1.5 kind of thing, you know? And then you could, uh, yeah, I always do like a 1.5, you know, chapter 1.5, where I just kind of fill you in on what you missed. So that, yeah, so that you don't have to like, you know, go to chapter two and be like, whoa, why are you talking about chapter one? Um, again, just in case you were like in the habit of only wanting to discuss chapter two on chapter two. All right, uh, where were we? Sorry, I just, like, usually you should finish the paragraph before you jump upside, but I was just distracted. Uh, yeah, so fully funny stuff. These seeds can be seen to grow in the following way. <coughs> Descartes, so in Sippy, obviously, he's, he describes it, what it means. Descartes supposes to doubt everything which might be known through the senses or through the reason. He sets out to doubt everything which might be known through the senses because the senses sometimes suffer from illusions and delusions, not to mention the fact that anything which is said to be formed part of waking experience can equally for, well form part of a dream experience. After all, so basically like virtual reality could like fool you, right? Uh, but also dreams could fool you, right? You could feel cold in a dream when it's not, when you're not really cold on your body, right? After all, the objects and situations which dreams represent are not qualitatively different from the representation of senses. Since the senses can be affected by illusions and delusions, he proposes to treat them as unreliable witnesses to truth. And as to the reason, though, as in the best of times, he wishes to hold it to be essentially infallible, he points at the well-known paralogism of his predecessors in philosophy and geometry. If reason could be so badly... If reason could so badly have misled them, it too must, for the same for the time being, be regarded as untrustworthy, right? So, uh, yeah, so it's actually, so like I said, he's really just, like, here, here in this section, he's just like, look, you read Descartes, right? So now I could show you how Descartes is wrong, therefore you should read me, you know? Like, this is just kind of like, yeah, Descartes ain't all that, you know? Like, I'm going to do something better than Descartes. Descartes. I don't know how to say his name, but yeah, Descartes. I'm gonna do something better than Descartes. And and you know, this is like I, I do this too. You know, like I'd be like going in on different uh, you know African predecessors or even European predecessors, and be like, yeah, well, you know, I got something to show because you read this person. You know, uh, so this is just like, like again, like I said, you gotta look at uh, Kwame Nkrumah from a uh, from a from a like a, like on a subconscious level so as a human being, right? So he's a human being and he's going over death, like because he could easily just articulate himself without going in on Descartes. But what happens is that people... Like, if, if you're familiar with writing anything that you put into the academic world or you put into the world itself, people will always be like, well, have you considered this? Have you looked into this person? Have you have you read this? You know? Uh, what do you know about this? So, basically, this is his example of, look, I know about this. I know about Descartes. 
I know about solipsism. I know about idealism. I know about rationalism. I know about empiricism. I know this thing like the back of my hands, but I'm, jo- I'm going to show you something different. I'm going to show you consciousism. Consciousism. Okay? I'm going to show you that. But it's not like he's not going to just jump right into consciousism and be like, um, like, like I, I wouldn't even be surprised if he's going to go deep into Marx later on, right? But like, he's not going to just jump into consciousism because if he does that, people, people like a lot of people are going to be like, well, has he has he heard of Maoism? Has he heard of Marxism? Has he heard of you know? So you know, this is this is this is just the backdrop. This is the, this is the backdrop for why from before he brings out his philosophy, and you kind of pick up pick that up from the table of contents. So the table of contents, like chapter four, is consciousism. So he's gonna go through three different chapters before going into his philosophy, because that's like because if he just went to his philosophy, right? Not only would it be a shorter book, but it also might be that people are gonna read it and be like, "Well, have you have you considered this kind of stuff?" It's it's really just like again, philosophies exist in a point in time. You know, they exist in a point in time, and so in this point in time. Kwame and Krimer writing a philosophy book doesn't really appeal to many people. You know? Like, it doesn't, like, just straight up writing philosophy, you know, it's like, are you even qualified? You know, you're the president of a country, right? Are you even qualified? So that's really what this is. Um, anyway, Descartes notes just in time that he who is anxious about the truth and doubts everything uh, has been thinking and must exist if he thinks. Uh, Hobbes was misguided when he thought that it was equally open to Descartes to say that because he walked, he existed. Descartes, having doubted away his body, could not suppose himself to walk. But even if he doubted that he thought, he would still be thinking, as doubting was a form of thinking. It was necessary for Descartes to single out what he could not coherently doubt in order to peg his existence on it. And that is why he says that he thinks, therefore he exists. So, so yeah, you see that uh, Hobbes... Right again, and again, remember, all these are humans, are in a sense, right? If you if you if you extend humanity to Wazuka, right? But all these are humans, right? In a sense that Descartes is just a person, Hobbes is just a person, and Krum is just a person, and so, and Krum was like, hey, Hobbes was like, hey, you don't have to say that you you exist because you think, you could say you exist because you walk, right? You know, like a, a duck exists because a duck is walking, right? Uh, a, a a cat exists because a cat can walk. Right, if, if something is doing something, it, it does that. Right, and Descartes is saying Descartes, and so the crew was like, "No, Hobbes mistook that." Right, in the sense that realistically speaking, you cannot doubt that you are thinking, because because see, you could dream that you're walking when you're not walking, like like kind of like you know like uh, people, you could have a a dream of of you know you could have a dream that you're with you know. What's his name? A woman, a Marlon Negra, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? You with Marlon Negra, you know what I'm saying? Or Rihanna or something, you know what I mean? Uh, or you know, like uh, you know, somebody else. But you know, the point being, you could have a dream, or or even like you know, for those for 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 the handful of women that might be enticed by this voice, you might have a dream that you were laying down with, uh, uh, you know, uh, yours truly, but it might not necessarily be the case. Now. Uh, <laughs> maybe it is the case, but uh, <laughs> all right, at least not. But you get what I'm saying. It's like you could you 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 could be you could be fooled into having an experience, like having a body experience that's not necessarily the case. And of course, you know this kind of example, people understand to be the quote unquote matrix, right? Uh, like like they use that they use the word matrix for that nowadays because there's a movie like that. Uh, but also, I think there's this uh, recently. Uh, this 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 entity called uh, Zuckerberg uh, was uh, saying something about virtual reality worlds. I didn't really pay attention to it, but you know, like those are kind of things too, where you can like like virtual reality video games. If you guys are not familiar, or even video games, if you're not familiar, like you could think you're doing something when you're not doing that thing that you think you're doing. You know, but dreams are really the best example. I actually read some of Descartes and Hobbes, so I'm familiar with what they're talking about. But I can see if you didn't read this stuff that you might be like, what are you talking about? But anyway, uh, but it is at this point that Descartes runs the gauntlet of a creeping solipsism. Though Descartes is entitled to say, cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I exist, he would clearly be understanding too much if he understood from this that some object existed, let alone that Monsieur Descartes existed. All that is indisputable is the first section of Descartes' statement is that there is thinking. The first person is in that statement no more than the subject of a verb. 
with no more connotation of an object than there is an anticipatory it of the existence it is raining. The pronoun in this sentence is a mere subject of a sentence and does not refer to any object or group of objects which is raining. It is it in that sentence does not stand for anything. It is a quack pronoun, right? It is raining. Like what is raining exactly? Right? Exactly. So basically, what he's saying is that you know you could say I think therefore I am, but who is to say that you exist? You know, uh, you know I think therefore I exist. You know, but yeah, who who are you? Why is it that you exist? All you can say is that thinking happened, right? And that's what this is what Kruger is saying. Uh, and so once again, we have an unattached experience thinking without an object which thinks. Right, like, like, yeah. Why is there an object? Because again, like I said, like the duck is thinking. Like some people don't believe that ducks think, but I, I do. Uh, notwithstanding, it's like, uh, yeah, the duck is thinking. Like, like, but like again, like it just, it just, it doesn't say that something exists from that. Is what uh, Encrim was pointing out. Now, obviously, like I said, you you don't have to uh, really care about this part. It's just really just the backdrop. This is really the background. It's not really. The philosophy and the ideology for decolonization. It's not consciousism. This is just the background of different Western philosophical schools of thought and their flaws, and 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 you know the exposure of their ideas. You know, uh, not just their flaws, but just like just an articulation of the different ideas. And I mean, for those of you who, who, who like, just to clarify, we're, we're going to go back to this page, page eighteen. But you look at the name of this subject. This one, it's philosophy and retrospect. So he's really just giving a retrospect of Western philosophies, right? And like, you go back to the table of contents just to check it out. Some of his philosophy in retrospect, which is, the, again, the retrospective of the philosophies. Then it's gonna be philosophy and society, which is gonna be society and its role for philosophy. And of course, society and ideology, how important ideology is for society. So basically how important philosophy is for society, then how important society is for ideology. And then he's gonna go into conscientism, which is his philosophy of the decolonization of Africa and obviously um, so on and so forth. So just 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 just, just let me know, right? Um, I think I already read this, but I'm going to read it again, I guess. Oh, no, I didn't read it. Okay, so and so once again, we have an unattached experience thinking without an object which thinks, and as the subject is merely grammatical, it cannot serve as a genuine principle of a collection of thoughts which will mark one batch of thoughts as belonging to one person rather than another. The universe thus becomes... A plurality of thoughts which are unattached. So, oh uh, yeah. So, like basically, that's another thing too. It's like who's to say that your thoughts are yours? You know, like like that's not that doesn't come from this thing because it could just be that you're thinking in, uh, like that your thinking and my thinking are parallel, like like are just part of the same thing, right? And not to say that you exist separately and that in fact we're just thinking from something even bigger than us, maybe perhaps, or even if there isn't us, right? So it's like it's like it's not really conclusive evidence as much as Descartes is saying it is. Um, but again, like I said, it's not really that important. It's just I'm, just, I'm just, I'm just explaining this thing for you in case you're like scratching your head because a lot of people were saying they scratch their head. And plus, shout out to Lero, for those who don't know. That's a cool sister. Uh, she's on uh, Twitter. Uh, I can't remember her name off the top of my head, but you know, you follow me, you follow her, whatever, right? Um, but like, yeah, she was like, you should do a book club thing. So, you know, maybe, I'm, at least I have one person listening. Um, maybe it's more than one person, but, you know, notwithstanding, uh, you know, this is, this is, like, just explaining it, you know? Uh, all right, so, it is more normal to found idealism upon some theory of perception. Um, hence the idealist holds that we only know of the external world through perception, and if matter be held to be constitutive of the external world, then we only know of matter through perception. Quite gratuitously, the conclusion is drawn that matter owes its existence to perception, Granted that perception is a function of the mind or spirit, matter ends up depending on spirit for its existence. Uh, so again, like that's a little bit, you know, confusing. You know, not confusing, but a little convoluted. Um, but you get, you get why Nkrumah was gonna like swipe it to the side. I'm at the stage compelled to emphasize, uh, emphasize once more that our own bodies are elements in the external world. So he's like, yeah, you can't look at, you can't look at the mind that's perceived like again we are physical beings ourselves so you can't just look at us from a metaphysical per paradigm you can't just look at us as oh well you know we're just spirit and sense no you are a physical body in fact you know and this is the thing that i want to approach this on my own book so i'm actually grateful uh so shout out to lero for saying that i should do this book too but 
Uh, but I'm, I'm actually grateful that I get to read this book because I want to write on metaphysics. And so this is like a really good, uh, you know, description, a retrospect of those metaphysical ideas, right? Uh, and a dismissal of them. So again, he says, look, I want to emphasize once more that our own bodies are elements in this external world. So if therefore matter were dependent on a knowledge for its existence, so would our own bodies be. In that case, however, a perception would require an altogether new conception. Few perception only take place by agency of the senses, and the senses are capacities... No, for perception only takes place by agency of the senses, and the senses are capacities of the living and organic body. If therefore body being matter wins its existence from perpetual knowledge, it cannot, it could not at the time, same time be the means to that knowledge. It could not itself be the avenue to perception. The idea of perception through physical senses therefore becomes incoherent in idealism. And with this one step, uh, idealism collapses in our hands. Indeed, idealism itself stands revealed as the self-devouring co cormorant of philosophy. Uh, philosophy. And then, you know, you really got to say this too. It's like, it's like you can't see without freaking eyes. That's what, I, that's what I'm going to say. You can't see without eyes. You can't smell without a nose. You know, and you can't do echolocation at all because you're not a bat. You know, <laughs> like, 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 the, like the, 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 you, your body is going to give you these senses. It's not the spirit that gives you these senses. You know, because the, the blind person is just like, you know, Ray Charles has the same spirit as you if you want to go by spirit. Like, like, if you go by the spirit ideology, the spirit idea, right? If you believe that anybody has a spirit or whatever, Ray Charles has a spirit or Stevie Wonder has a spirit, right? But they can't see. You, you, you get what I'm saying? So it's like, it's like you can't, you can't, and then like I said, the bat, I, I'm not sure if bats are blind or not, I believe they might be, I don't know, but the point is that they go by echolocation, or dolphins go by echolocation, a sense that we don't have as human beings, you know, and so if you were to, I don't know, people say that they have spirits as well, but, you know, if you go by that paradigm of, oh yeah, they have spirits too, the, the senses, the spirit and senses, is, it's, again, it's a physical phenomenon, so that's just, Something that I really think is uh, interesting as well. So, you know, like I said, shout out to everybody. 18th century African philosopher from Ghana, Anthony William Amo, who taught in the German universities of Halle, Jenna, and Wittenberg, uh, pointed out in his De Humane Mente Apatie that idealism was enmeshed in contradictions. The mind, he said, was conceived by idealism as a pure, active, unextended substance. Ideas, the alleged constituents of physical objects, were held to be only in the mind and to be incapable of existence outside of it. Amos, uh, question I hear, oh, Amos, Amos, right? <laughs> Amos' question here was how the ideas, largely those of physical objects, many of which were ideas of extension, could subsist in the mind since physical objects were actually extended. If they were really ideas, some ideas must be actually extended. And if all ideas must be in the mind, it became hard to resist the conclusion that the mind itself was extended in order to be a spatial receptacle for its extended ideas. The contradiction is in the denial of the spatial nature of mind and the compulsion to harbor spatial objects in it. For in idealism, it is not only our bodies which are in our minds. Instead of our minds being in our bodies, the whole universe, to the extent that we can perceive or be aware of it, is neatly tucked away in our minds. So obviously he's like, yeah. So he says, idealism suffers from what I might call the God complex. It is what Marx called intoxicated speculation. It is what may be called the ecstasy of intellectualism, the concept of an object. So you see, Marx also was tired of this academic stuff, the astutes, like I would point out. You know, the astutes, like I don't like the astutes. Like one of the things that people know about me is that I don't really, like I, I be going after like African intellectuals all the time. And it's like, because I don't like the intellectuals, like real talk. Now people are like, hey, but Oni, aren't you an intellectual? Yeah, but I, yeah, you know? <laughs> like, 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 like that's, the thing that, that's the thing that motivates me to say, look, that's like one of my, that's one of the flaws I don't like. I wanna be active on the ground, building, developing, helping our people. This is what it's about. And I don't like, you know, just intoxicated speculation. I don't like God complexes. I don't like ecstasy of intellectualism. I want to be out. Of the, so when I went to Africa, when I went to uh, Ghana, I was just in the community, living with them, teaching with them, building with them. That's what it's about. You know, like, like patronizing them, helping them, all that kind of stuff. That's what you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to sit back and be like, you know, I think, you know, Africa needs to be liberated. We need to liberate our continent. And then, you know, you go back to work. No! You, 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 you say, I gotta live on my continent and I'm there. I'm building roads. I'm putting street signs up. I'm do, do, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. Building industry. 
whatever it is, but you want to be practical and on the ground and on the hands, and this is the, this is the thing that a lot of people go through. Like I said, Marx goes through, or, or or like I said, all of us go through. Where we're like, hey, what's the why, when are we going to use trigonometry? You know, like when are we going to use sine, cosine, and tangent? You know, um, anyway, so the concept of an object, let alone the concept of the same object, cannot be properly formulated in idealism. Having once dismantled the world, idealists are unable to put it together again. And Berkeley has to say that this apple is only a, simul is only a simultaneity of sweetness, roundness, smoothness, etc. It is as if one could not have soup anymore, but only its ingredients. The distinction between reality and appearance slips between the spectral fingers of idealism. For an idealism, reality becomes merely a persistent appearance. In this way, idealism makes itself incompatible with science. Right? So this is actually a pretty good retrospective philosophy. I'm going to give Nkrumah some credit for that. The matter uh, of Western philosophy, really. But anyway, the matter can exist unperceived. And actually, I like that when he went into the African uh, philosopher, that he didn't, like, 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 demean him. You know, like, he didn't dismiss him. He just said, you know what, my brother. You know, like, I like that. Like, that's, that's how it's supposed to be, man. I not to say that. Not to say that I always do that. You know what I'm saying? But, like, but, but that's because I don't really go into white boys. You know what I mean? So because I don't really talk about white boys like that, it's like I, you got to talk about somebody. Like you got to call somebody in the stoop, you know? But, but you know, but because I don't do that, you know, I might, I might be like, yeah, but Nkrumah. But like you're still honoring Nkrumah in that sense, you know? Uh, shout out to Nkrumah again, right? All right, so anyway, this matter can exist unperceived. That is, that it has a continuance independent of mind should really, really be axiomatic. Idealists themselves hanker after this independent reality when they strive so hard to reconcile their theoretical ebullience with the sobriety of ordinary language. Sorry, sorry. I, I just, sometimes you just like stop. All right. So the mat, this, the mat, that matter can exist unperceived, that it has a continuous independence of mind, should really be axiomatic. So, yeah, so matter can exist unperceived, right? That is that, like for instance, uh, whether or not you ever saw Jupiter, Jupiter is there, right? Uh, has a continuous, it has a continuance independent of the mind, right? Should really be axiomatic, right? Idealists themselves hanker after this independent reality when they strive so hard to reconcile their theoretical ebullience with the sobriety of ordinary language. Ordinary language is not just a vocabulary and a grammar. It also comprises a conceptual framework which is largely realist and objectivist. The idealist attempts to reconcile his theory spinning with ordinary language must therefore be regarded as a deep-seated desire to anchor idealism in a certain measure of objectivity. Now, materialism is a serious, objective, almost descriptive kind of metaphysics. As a minimum, so now he's going to go into materialism, which is pretty cool. Uh, again, materialism, maybe it's building up to Marxism. Those you don't know, sorry. Those, those you don't know, Marxism is a, that, uh, sorry. Okay. I was supposed to, I was supposed to go, I was supposed to spit. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> all right, so, uh, that's unusual. All right, that was kind of gross. Sorry about that. I should have muted. Um, it's just like you didn't want to walk away, and then you're like, I wonder what was, well, was the worst thing that could happen. And then it's like, oh, yeah, then I forgot. That's terrible. So I'm probably going to use a rest of my this. But anyway. Uh, now, materialism is a serious, objective, almost descriptive kind of metaphysics. Uh, so, yeah, for those of you who don't know about Marxism, it's called dialectical materialism. Uh, dialectical materialism or he he Hegelian dialectics. Uh, but the idea is that materialism is at the center of it. So he's going to start talking about materialism now. And maybe he's building up to materialism being pretty good philosophically, but possibly not so because, again, he's promoting conscientism. So, uh, uh, conscientism. I don't know how to pronounce it. But anyway. Uh, now, materialism is a serious, objective, almost descriptive kind of metaphysics. Okay? As a minimum, it affirms the existence of matter independent of knowledge by mind. This minimal conception is obviously grossly inadequate. It is open to a materialist philosophy, but not compulsory, to assert for its second thesis the primary reality of matter. Hence, here matter would be whatever has mass and is perceptually active. And in this manifestation, matter would be coextensive with the universe. If, however, the, role, the sole or primary reality of matter is asserted, one is brought up sharply against certain hard facts, notably those, center, those center, centering... Okay, I think that's a typo. Those centering around the phenomenon of consciousness and of self-consciousness, right? So just so let's uh, 
we're just so like, like you know, everybody has typos. You know, even if you're the president of Ghana and you have a uh, thing, now you want to avoid that, but like it's like so hard. It's so hard because, because you know, if you're the editor, you're gonna read this and be like, don't be those centric, you know, and just like because you're reading the whole freaking philosophical text, you know, a hard, difficult text, and you're looking for every word, and then you just your brain just automatically tells you centering, and then later on, you know, it's like, oh dang, this came through. But you know, the only reason why I caught it is because I'm just like reading it out loud, and you know on record and all that kind of stuff. But even then, like, I might have not caught some things before this, you know? It is what it is. Sorry. If, however, the soul or primary reality of matter is asserted, uh, one is brought up sharply against certain hard facts, notably those centering around the phenomenon of consciousness and of self-consciousness, right? Uh, so he's like, yeah, if we're just talking about matter, right? So if, however, the soul or primary reality of matter is asserted, uh, one is brought up sharply against certain hard facts. So it's like, even if you're just talking about matter, right? What about consciousness? Is consciousness just matter? You know, and that's one of those questions that, you know, uh, some people do think about even today, which is, you know, because like, particularly if you're talking about artificial intelligence, you're like, hey, can artificial intelligence be conscious because it's just a machine and there's nothing else to it? But now you might say, and some people who are like on the artificial intelligence side, you know, I heard this from my brother like when I was like in high school or something, right? And he's like, a, he's like a cool, but anyway. Uh, but like, uh, like a blood brother, right? Uh, he's like, uh, yeah, you know, humans are just machines. You know, humans are just machines and, and, and so on and so forth. But, you know, is that the case now? You know, uh, like, again, this is why I like the word metaphysics now because it's like there's a physics, there's a physical body and a metaphysical body, like a body that might be derived from, uh, from the physical body, but it is, in fact, something different altogether, you know? Uh, and, you know, the thing that I would say, just to, you know, to, to preview what my next book should be about, is that, you know, like your physical body might have strength and, 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 and physique and so on and so forth, but then your metaphysical uh, is more so, uh, you know, your intelligence, your wisdom, you know? What are these things in terms of matter? Now, you could possibly be like, hey, there's electronic signals and you know, chemical storages and so on and so forth, and maybe it is all that. But, you know, maybe, but like, as far as understanding that in depth, you know, who necessarily understands it at this point is, uh, is the question. And not to say that it's impossible to understand, but for the most part, a lot of us do not understand that stuff. And this is why, this is like partly why you have these things like religions and spiritualities and so on and so forth, because understanding has not reached that point where you actually understand why I have a memory of a childhood or why I could, or why I could tell you what happened in my, uh, you know, when I was in, in university or whatever, right? Why can I tell you this stuff? Uh, is it because of a physical biological, so on and so forth, is there something else to it? So anyway, so if consciousness is to be explained in terms of overt response to stimuli, then it must be distinguished from self-consciousness and perception from apperception. Apperception. Of self-consciousness, we only have an internal experience. Another hard fact is the distinction between qualities and quantities, while a third is the distinction between energy and matter. So energy and, and matter are not the same thing, of course, right? And so one might unwarily think that the assertion of the soul or even primary reality of matter in the face of the above hard facts betrays an unwarranted intrepidity, intrepidity in face of paradox and categorical absurdity. The key to the solution of the problem, the key to the accommodation of these hard facts, lies in categorical convertibility, but it is not the task of philosophy to chase the details of such categorical conversions, that is one of the tasks of science. Philosophy is only called upon to show the possibility of the conversion. By categorical conversion, I mean such a thing as the emergence of self-consciousness from that which is not self-conscious, such a thing as the emergence of mind from matter or of quality from quantity. So, again, he's talking about science, he's talking about, like, like right, right here, he's actually talking about artificial intelligence in that sense, right? Self-consciousness from something that's not conscious. So you have a bunch of circuits, you have a bunch of, uh, of, of you know, programs, you have a bunch of, even a computer, whatever, and it becomes conscious. How? You know? That's, that's, that's the question. And like, like, like I'm telling you, he's showing you his breath. He's showing you that, yeah, I know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm talking about, like, he's, he's well-read. He's well-read. You could give him that, right? So philosophy can demonstrate the possibility of the conversion in one or other of two ways, either by means of a conceptual analysis 
or by pointing at a model. And so actually, what, what, what he says right here, sorry, he says this is a task of science. Philosophy is just going to tell you that there's, there's a possibility, right? But the task of science is to really establish that kind of stuff or investigate that kind of thing, right? Um, the chase of details or whatever, right? So anyway, uh, philosophy can demonstrate the possibility of the conversion in one or other of two ways, either by means of a conceptual analysis or by pointing at a model. As it happens, philosophy is in a position to do both. Philosophy prepares itself for the accommodation of the hard facts by asserting not the crude sole reality of matter, but its primary reality. Other categories must then be shown to be able to arise from matter through process. It is at this point that philosophical materialism becomes dialectical. Problems of categorical conversion have haunted philosophy at least since early Greek times. The Greek monists, beginning as far as we know with Thales, were all confronted with such problems. Wait, sorry. Problems of categorical conversion have haunted philosophy at least since early Greek times. The Greek monists, beginning as far as we know with Thales, were all uh, confronted with such problems. Um, so what is a monist? I'm not really too sure. But uh, actually, let's look up that. Let me look it up quickly. Um, so the Greek monist. The monist. So, uh, oh, mon okay, a view that there is only one kind of ultimate substance, right? So, so when he said Thales was, uh, uh, you know, it's like, oh, everything is water, you know? Uh, that's that's what a monist is. Um, yeah. I, like, my mind is still on that unplugging thing. So I'm really thinking about that 1.5. I just don't know because what I could have done was I could have checked to see if I was being recorded, if my audio was being picked up on my on my thing, but I just instinctively plugged my mic back in and so I can't really tell whether or not I was heard or not so my mind is kind of like a little distracted on that but anyway so problems of categorical conversion have haunted philosophy at least since early Greek times the Greek monists beginning as far as we know with Thales were all confronted with such problems thinking that opposites were irreducible to each other Thales successor and his demander uh, postulated a neutral monism in his boundless and amorphous undifferentiated undetermined source capable of begetting opposite properties the womb of the differentiated world. It seems to me, however, that neutral monism is merely crypto-dualism or crypto-pluralism, for even if they are only in a uh, stifled state, all the elements of dualist and pluralist positions swim in neutral monism, right? So, uh, again, like, uh, so that's actually pretty interesting, too, because, you know, if, you, if you're familiar with uh, African uh, philosophy, right, uh, there's this uh, idea of noon, like from the universe comes like noon was was what uh, came like what the universe was originally, right? And that's just this amorphous to the darkness, and then from that, uh, you know, Ra takes it out. And, and realistically speaking, if you really to read it, uh, it kind of does parallel the Big Bang story, uh, but it just kind of anthropomorphizes it, um, which I, which you know I know you've heard me earlier say, oh that's a Western thing, yeah. Um, but like no, I, I I'm I'm pretty pretty familiar with. Uh, anthropomorphizing uh, as a just a human phenomenon. But of course, you know, humans, it doesn't change the fact that humans are a relatively recent creation in terms of the timeline of the universe. You know, that's not to say that I don't see any, that's not to say I don't see the value in in, in anthropomorphizing the, the universe uh, for, you know, for educational purposes. But what I would also add is that I tend to look at these as children's stories. You know, uh, you know, children's stories or as cultural expressions for um, or expressions for cultural solidarity, you know, for, for culture to or for, for political solidarity and economic solidarity, you know. But it's really just that it's 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 like it's, it's a functional, uh, it's a functional framework. Um, not to say that. So it's not to say that it's a true or untrue, but more so to say um, that it's functional. So I'm just checking my phone because I hear the. I hear like a sound on it. Uh, anyway, so um, so yeah, but anyway, neutral neutral monism is just an interesting tidbit. All right, so today, however, philosophy has little need to resort to cryptism, crypticism, right? Uh, so anyway, you also, also some of you were like crypto. What crypto? 
right. Criticism. Uh, speaking in general terms, I may say that philosophy has fashioned two branches of study which enable it to solve the problems of categorical conversion in a satisfying way. These tools are logic and science, both of which owe their origin and early development to the demands of philosophy. The conceptual tools which philosophy has fashioned is logic and by means of which it can cope with the formal problems of categorical conversion are contained in nominalism, constructive, constructionism, and reductionism. For philosophy's model of categorical conversion in turns to science, matter and energy are two distinct, but as science has shown, not unconnected or reducible categories, right? E equals mc squared. Energy equals mass times this, uh, the, the speed of light squared, right? Uh, 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 Oh, well, that's not, I shouldn't have said that actually, <laughs> but you guys got to say. Uh, uh, has a, uh, science has shown not unconnected or irreducible categories. The interreducibility of matter and energy offers a model for categorical conversion. And another model is given in the distinction between physical change and chemical change. For in chemical change, physical quantities give rise to emergent qualities. In nominalism, constructivism, and materialist reductionism, one holds some category to be a primary category of reality and holds other real things to become real only insofar as they are ultimately derived from the primary category of reality. The derivation is such that for every true proposition about an item which falls under a derivative category, they are provided true propositions about items falling under the primary category, such that the former proposition cannot be true unless the latter proposition were true. And there, further, such that the former proposition could not even make sense unless there were items falling under the primary category. So let's see if he can, uh, yeah, okay, so he's going to give an example. But, you know, this is pretty much common. It's like, hey, look. These ideas have a primary category of reality, and they have to apply to everything in reality. And maybe they might be applying to something derivative of that reality, but only because they apply to the primary category of reality. So he's going to give an explanation. He's like, for an exploratory comparison, one can take the average man. The average man belongs to a category derivative from the category of living men and women. For any true proposition about the average man, there must be a true proposition about men and women, such that the proposition about the average man could not be true unless the proposition about men and women were true. Further, propositions about the average man could not even make sense unless there were items falling under the category of men and women. That is, propositions about the average man could not make sense unless, they were act unless there were actual men and women. So if you're like, hey, so he's like, yeah. So if you say, hey, look, the average man is uh, six feet tall, right? Right, but you get what I'm saying. The average man is six feet tall. Then there has to be some men who are have height. You know, maybe they don't have to exactly be six feet. I guess, but they have to have some height. Yeah, <laughs> like you can't have men with no height and then be like. I mean, I, I well, you can't have no man with no height. You get what I'm saying? Uh, like, like, like. Like, 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 there has to be some men with height uh, to have an average height, pretty much. Um, if that makes sense, I, I, it's, it's, you get what I'm saying, right? Uh, like, I don't know why he wrote women here too, but, um, but you get what I'm saying, right? I mean, like I said, it's not really that important. He's just going on the retrospective philosophy. It really has nothing to do with conscience himself. I'm not really like diddle dowling on it. I just want you to read it, understand it see it from some conscious level too, and that's all okay. In the same way, if one says that matter is the primary category, then spirit must, to the extent that it is recognized as a category, be a derivative category, okay? So you're like, hey, look, the world is just matter, right? The world is made out of matter. Then where does spirit come in? Spirit then is also a form of matter. See what I'm saying? That's what he's saying. If, if you're saying that matter is the fundamental category of the universe, then spirit is also a form of matter. Now, what spirit means, who knows, but, you know, there you go. In the same way, if one says that matter is a primary category, then spirit must, to the extent that it is recognized as a category, be a derivative category. And in order that propositions about spirit should make sense, there must be matter. Secondly, even when propositions about spirit make sense, in order that they should be true, certain propositions about matter need to be true, right? So now you're going to go to different schools. In constructivism, uh, in constructionism, one has to picture has to picture how those concepts 
which are proper to the re- now. Actually, I want I want to just just go over this again because you only have three more pages. Okay, so it stops at page twenty five. Okay, we have four more pages. Wait, what? I thought it stopped at oh shoot. I was thinking that we we're gonna stop at page twenty five. We're actually page twenty nine. Okay, so let me just speed up a little bit. But um, why I damn so we're probably, we're pretty behind. Um. We're pretty behind. I gotta feed myself, right? <laughs> All right. And construction is a yeah, but like, what well, I do want to say that this is like this is good because he's like, look, you could talk this matter stuff, but what about spirit? Okay. Um, and it's like a lot of people, like a lot of us, you know, are gonna be like, what? The, what are you talking about? Why would you bring up spirit? But it's still good that he brings up spirit. You know, it's good that it's like a a good display of you know, yes, I consider it even spirit. You know, in constructionism, one has a picture. One has a picture how those concepts, which are proper to derivative categories, might be formed. Using a raw materialist, materials concept, which are proper to the primary category. In reductionism, one sees how concepts proper to a derivative category can be reduced completely to concepts which are proper to a primary category. So, all right, sorry. In constructionism, one has a picture how those concepts, which are proper to derivative categories, might be formed. One has a picture how those concepts which are proper to derivative categories might be formed. Now remember, derivative categories to say, like spirit would be a derivative category of 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 of, of matter. Okay, so he's like in constructionism, one has a picture how those concepts which are proper to derivative categories might be formed using a raw material concepts which are proper to the primary category. So you use the primary category to this to 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 picture the the. Uh, the derivative category, right? You use matter to describe spirit, okay? In reductionism, one sees how concepts proper to a derivative category can be reduced completely to concepts which are proper to a primary category. So, on the other hand, uh, you would, you would, uh, you would find, con- like reductionism, you would find concepts that are reduced from the concepts of the primary category. When a certain reductionism holds matter to be primary, such a reductionism has for its product concepts which are directly applicable only to matter. In nominalism, only concrete existences are held to be primary and real. All other existences uh, being, as it were, surrogates of concrete existences on a higher logical plane, right? So he's going over, so these are the three different types of materialist philosophies, the constructionism, nominalism, and uh, reductionism. And he kind of speaks about that before. Right here he says nominalism, constructionism, and materialist reductionism, right? And these are the... Uh, so for him, I think he said the modern categories. No, 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 I don't think he said it. But anyway, um, yeah. So, all right, larger, higher planes. All existence and its surrogate to concrete existence. So, so right. Now, it would, of course, be a mistake to seek to infer from the foregoing that according to philosophical dialectical materialism, right? So dialectical materialism, we got to it. Mind is, say, brain. Um, qualities are quantities. Energy is mass. These locutions would commit what are referred to as category mistakes, right? So he says, now it would of course be a mistake to seek to infer from the foregoing that according to philosophical and dialectical materialism, right, mind is brain, qualities are quantities, energy is mass, and he says these locutions would commit what are referred to as category mistakes. So you can't say they're the same things even though they might be derivative or might be related, so on and so forth. The dialectical materialism recognizes the difference between mind and brain, between qualities and quantity, between energy and mass. It, however, gives a special account of the nature of the differences. Both in metaphysics and in theory of knowledge, it does not allow the differences to become fundamental and irreducible. Right? Uh, It does not allow the... So, both in metaphysics and in theory of knowledge, it does not allow the differences to become fundamental and irreducible. A sober philosophy cannot ignore categorical differences, but it has the right to give a valid account of these differences in such a way as to reveal them as fécondes de parler. Right? From the standpoint of theory of knowledge, philosophical materialism treats the differences as belonging to logical grammar. This, if how, if one may express an opinion... Sorry. From the standpoint of theory of knowledge, philosophical materialism treats the differences as belonging to logical grammar. This, if one may express an opinion, is a kind of difference also drawn by Frege between concepts and objects, when he said with truth that the concept horse was not a concept, but an object. The difference in question is a difference in the role or function of certain terms. 
and a difference is subject to logical parsing. So basically, you know, they're saying that, you know, realistically speaking, a lot of times when we talk about differences, we're really talking about grammar. And if we're talking about horses as a concept, it's not really a concept, but it's an object. There's a horse, right? Um, in a sense. And, 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 and Kuma agrees with that. He's of the objective, you know, physical school, which is really what you should, well, really a good school of thought. Right? So let me illustrate this point in another way. Suppose a man were asked to provide an inventory of objects in a room. When he counted all the legs of tables and chairs, as well as flat tops and backs, then he could not in the same inventory count tables and chairs. Wait. And, wait, what? So suppose a man were asked to provide an inventory of objects in a room, and he counted all the legs of tables and chairs, as well as flat tops and backs, then he could not in the same inventory count tables and chairs. True, though, it is that a table comprises of flat top and legs. There is nevertheless a difference between a table and a flat top and legs. The difference is said to be epistemological, not ontological. That is to say, tables do not exist on the one hand, while on the other hand, tops and legs exist alongside. Right? In the same way, one must admit epistemological differences between mind and brain, quality and quantity, energy and mass, without accepting any metaphysical difference between them. Uh, without, in other words, admitting that for mind one needs any more than a brain in a certain condition, for quality any more than a certain disposition of quantity, for energy any more than a mass in certain critical states. So I'll explain this to people who might be like, what? So like, let's say you're, you're in a room, like, like this is the example, you're in a room, and you're like, hey, count all of the, uh, like count everything, right? Uh, basically, like, like, like take an inventory of the room. Basically he's saying you, you wouldn't double count. So double count would be, if you're like, count all the tables, right? No, you're counting everything in the room, and then you count all the legs of the tables and all the table tops and all the, all the legs of the chairs, and then later on, you also count the tables and the chairs because then you just double the inventory, right? Because you're counting the table twice because you're saying, hey, there's a table as well as there's the body of the table. No, actually, the body and the table itself are the same thing, Right? That's what he's saying there. And so he's like, yes, you know, you do have mind and brain as different things, but you realize that brain and mind are really the, like, kind of the same thing in a sense that they, no, they exist together uh, simultaneously. You know, you don't have, you don't have quantity without quality. You don't have energy without mass kind of thing. You don't have uh, brain, a mind without brain. Uh, and I mean, of course, I'm just kind of like, like, don't take, like, take that with a grain of salt. I'm just really... Um, just really just saying that just for the sake of it, you know. But but more so, uh, it's like the, the 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 key thing is that they exist alongside each other, right? Uh, I don't really use the word ontological or epistemological. I know a lot of people who do, so I'm not really too familiar with. Uh, like I have to look it up to say that because again, I'm I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, just a village boy, you know, I'm a village boy, uh, <laughs> you know. So I don't really use this word. I don't I don't like these intellectual words. I like to communicate in a basic way, but. You know, just because I'm reading this book for you guys, that's why I'm, I'm exposing myself to this stuff. But anyway, from the standpoint of metaphysics, philosophical materialism accepts mind or conscience only as a derivative of matter. Right? From a standpoint of metaphysics, philosophical materialism accepts mind or conscience only as a derivative of matter. And so that's, that's the question that a lot of us have today. Like, is our mind or our conscience only just derivative of matter? So now nominalism, constructionism, and reductionism indicate that categorical differences are differences of logical grammar and syntax. And they're not real differences, it's just how we speak, right? Such differences are even so objective uh, and neither uh, arbitrary nor ideal. They are founded in the conditions of matter and its objective laws. Quality is a surrogate of a quantitative disposition of matter. It can be altered by altering quantitative dispositions of matter. So like... Yeah, what what is really quality, but just a type of quantity? Like you can alter quality by altering quantity, right? Uh, mind, according to philosophical materialism, is a result of a critical organization of matter. Nervous organization has to attain a certain minimum of complexity for the display of intelligent activity or the presence of mind. The presence of mind and the attainment of the critical minimum of organization of matter are one and the same thing. So basically, again, like, you know, you don't find mind in a roach. Now, I don't necessarily agree with that. You know, I feel like these roaches are pretty damn smart. But notwithstanding, uh, you know, it's like, uh, you know, what constitutes mind, right, is really just our nervous system. You know, our nervous system doing what it does. 
and it's not necessarily independent of the material world. It's a matter. It's a matter of matter, um, and and this is why some people hope to achieve this in the uh, machine world. Um, but you know, even though the machines do not have nervous systems, um, but the idea is that you could replicate a nervous system through uh, material, um, material and mechanical devices. Um, you know, that is a question you know in of itself, but. You know, you will, like you'll find a lot of people are interested in that question. So, nervous organization has to attain a certain minimum of complexity for display of intelligent activity or the presence of mind. <coughs> but of course, you have to realize that um, I, I do want to point out too that the uh, like the animal world, like the dog, has this advanced intelligence or this advanced uh, you know mind, um, notwithstanding the fact that they don't have this uh, advanced intelligence or what have you or this advanced wisdom. Um, as far as we know, as humans, because again, we don't communicate with dogs. Um, the presence of mind and the attainment of the critical minimum to an organization of matter are one and the same thing. Energy, too, is a critical quantitative process of matter. Heat, for example, is a particular sort of process of atoms. Though none of the above equivalences is a formal equivalence, they are at least material equivalences. That is to say, notwithstanding that the meaning of, say, mind is not a critical organization of nervous matter, as the meaning of submarine is a ship capable of moving underwater, mind is nothing but the upshot of matter with a critical nervous arrangement. The equivalence intended is a material one, not a defining or formal one. That is to say, the proposition about mind, quality, energy are reducible without residue to propositions about body, quantity, and mass. Yes, see? Uh, the former proposition could not make sense unless the la latter propositions were sometimes true. As it were, mind, quality, and energy are metaphysical adjectives. See, there's physical and metaphysical, the relationship between physical and metaphysical. So I'm not, like, like, like in Kruma, like, and Kruma's like, he, you gotta give him some credit. Like, outside of the miscegenation thing and the integrationism thing, well, not integrationism, but, you know, well, yeah, integrationism kind of, right? Outside of that, like, the non-racialism, like, he's a good brother. You know, he's a good brother. Um... Anyway, so uh, I think that matter would be further clarified if philosophical materialism were distinguished from nominalism, right? And oh, by the way, for those of you who might be like, hey, well, if not Nkrumah, who else? And it's like, Niede is a good guy, too. Okay, Niede, uh, yeah, I don't know how deeply intellectual Niede was, uh, especially in comparison to what we see right here from Nkrumah, but Niede was also, like, one of the, the amazing people of Africa, and, and realistically speaking, it's kind of shameful, it's kind of sad, but, but um, that these two intellectual giants were kind of at odds because Nkrumah, I guess Nkrumah just couldn't have uh, Niede outshine him, but Niede just naturally outshined him, kind of like Garvey with Du Bois, in a sense, you know? Um, just, just sometimes you just have somebody who's just, like, you're amazing, but then there's somebody who's just more amazing. And so that was Niede. Um, I do encourage you guys to... Uh, uh, look at the Niede, Niede, but um, I did have a podcast with Bitter Medicine uh, where we discussed the paper on Nkrumah and Niede's uh, feud, so make sure you go check out that podcast. Like I said earlier, um, what else can I say? Uh, yeah, that's that's just, it's just, it's just really good to see this level of, uh, you know, this, 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 this nice, because it's like, I wanted to write a book on war, and then I saw Nkrumah's book on war, and, then, and again, like, now I'm like, I want to write a book on philosophy, but and Krumba got this uh, philosophy pretty good, so, you know, we'll see how it goes. But, um, yeah, I think the matter would be further contained, clarified, if philosophical materialism were distinguished from nominalism, constructionism, and reductionism. The merit of the latter as a species of metaphysics arises from their demonstration of category reducibility. Their weakness as species of metaphysics rests in their lifelessness. They propose to tell us that X, strictly speaking, is or really is, or at bottom is nothing but YZ, but the vouchsafe not the slightest hint about the condition under which YZ is X, right? So, indeed, yeah, so, so, you know, basically, you know, go back to X and YZ being, uh, uh, so, like, X would play, like, say, we go back to spirit. It's like, spirit, strictly speaking, is really nothing but matter, but they don't really tell you how matter uh, matter is spirit. You know what I'm saying? Um, anyway. Uh, so, so it's, indeed, it is only in the philosophy of math mathematics in the generation of critical numbers that conditions are given for a categorical leap in the generation of numbers. 
When materialism becomes dialectical, the world is not regarded as a world of states, but as a world of processes. Uh, a world not of things, but of facts. The endurance of the world consists in process, and activity or process becomes a lifeblood of reality. Constructionism, nominalism, deductionism all stop at the logical basis of categorical conversion. They ascertain only that conversion is logically possible. But when materialism becomes dialectical, it ensures the material basis of categorical conversion. I, I'm, I'm still getting a little distracted. I'm a little sick, so let me read that again. When materialism becomes dialectical, right? So materialism becomes dialectical. That is like, you know, you have the opposing sides or whatever. The world is not regarded as a world of states, but as a world of processes, a world not of things, but of facts, right? Uh, so he, he's, he's saying right here, too, like, you know, the world is not regarded as a world of states, but a world of processes. As I say, the world is continually changing. That's one of the things about dialectical materialism uh, I want people to, that people should know. Uh, so, yeah, he says when materialism becomes dialectical, my bad. So, the thing about dialectical materialism is that the world is constantly evolving, constantly moving, constantly in struggle, constantly changing, right? And so, like, like you have capitalism that's going to be replaced by socialism. You have capitalism that replaces, uh, 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 what was it, uh, feudalism or something like that, or mercantilism, whatever, right? But the idea is that, you know, you don't just have a mercantilist world, you have a world that's constantly changing from mercantilism towards capitalism, then towards socialism, so on and so forth. So that's what this idea is, right? That, like, the world is not in a state, but it's in a process, right? A world not of things, but of facts, right? The endurance of the world consists in process, and activity or process becomes a lifeblood of reality. Uh, constructionism, anomalism, reductionism all stop at the logical basis of categorical conversion. They ascertain only that conversion is logically possible. But what materialism becomes dialectical, it ensures the material basis of categorical conversion. So it's to say that, yes, things change. Things change. They are not just being, but they're becoming. You know? Dialectical change in matter is that which serves as a ground to the possibility of the evolution of kinds. Okay? Again, evol evolution, change, transformation, processes, activity, so on and so forth. You know? A society evolved from primitive communism to feudalism to uh, 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 mercantilism and feudalism. Oh, sorry, feudalism to capitalism to communism eventually. Right. This is the premise: is that no, the world wasn't feudalist. The world wasn't this. It wasn't that. It didn't have slavery. It had slavery, but it wasn't just slavery. It was becoming something else. Now, I think that's a little bit too fatalistic. I think it's not really too realistic either, but it is. Um, but that's, this is what we're talking about when we're talking about dialectical materialism. So, dialectical change in matter is that which serves as a ground to the possibility of evolution of kinds. The evolution of a kind is that loss of a set of old properties and the acquisition of a new set through the dialectical movement of matter. When it is said that an evolved kind arises from or is reducible to matter, the concern is with the dialectical source or origin of the evolved kind, not with its formal nature. To say, therefore, that mind, quality, or energy arise from or is reducible to matter is neither to say that mind has mass or quality has mass, nor to say that energy has mass. It is to say that given the basic matter of the universe with its objective laws, the universe is forthwith closed in the sense that nothing can become present in the universe if it is not entirely anchored in the initial matter. So again, Big Bang Theory. Basically, there once was... Now, people might say that's actually the initial energy, Notwithstanding, there once was uh, matter, and we are all composed of that matter in some derivative fashion. Not to say that we are that original matter to begin with, but we are in some way. And so, like an example might be hydrogen. Hydrogen, uh, probably the building block of the universe, maybe 70% of the universe, who knows? I don't know the number from my head. But the idea is that, you know, how do you get, like, if you see hydrogen, it's not that it's not hydrogen, it's not that it's not, sorry, if you see helium, it's not that it's not hydrogen. It's just that hydrogen, two hydrogen, you know, form a bond together, uh, you know, collide, form a bond together, then they become helium. And all the elements like that just build up from there, whether it's a hydrogen and a helium, whether it's three heliums becoming carbon, whether it's how many heliums or how many hydrogens becoming oxygen, so on and so forth. The, the reality is that everything could go back into the fundamental atom, which is uh, hydrogen, right? Um, anyway. But that, of course, now, when he says matter, like when you go to physics, you're really talking about quarks and anti-quarks and, 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 and all those other, you know, leptons and whatever have you, right? You, know, you might go into the quantum, you know, whatever. 
You might go to smaller things, the things that make up neutrons, things that make up uh, make, make up electrons, things that make up protons, all those kind of things. You might go even deeper and be like, these are the fundamental products. Who knows, right? Say whatever you want to say. I don't care. Uh, the point being, though, is that um, that that's like like uh, all, the gist of it is that there is only the initial matter, right? That everything that there's no nothing else being added to the universe from the outside of the universe, but the universe is a self-contained uh, uh, system of everything that's available to it was already uh, available to it from the from the beginning, and there's nothing that's come in thereafter. Uh, or at least that, and and that's the thing that's just to say that as, as far as we know, right? So let me suggest a parallel with formal logic. An axiomatic formal system is said to be complete when its axioms suffice for the deduction by means of admitted rules of inference of all the propositions belonging to the system. <sighs> Sorry, this is this. All right, let me suggest a parallel with formal logic. An axiomatic formal system is said to be complete when its axioms suffice for the deduction by means of admitted rules of inference of all the propositions belonging to the system, right? So you're going to have something that's an axiomatically formal system if every if all its axioms suffice for deducing all of its rules or whatever, right? Uh, so I can see why somebody finds this difficult, right? Because it's like, it's like you probably want to have a philosophy background, right? <laughs> uh, if, uh, I'll be familiar with philosoph philosophical terms. I'm familiar with axiom from, you know, math mathematics and so on and so forth. So if propositions belonging to the system are made parallel to items of the universe, if the admitted rule of inference are made parallel to the objective laws of matter, and if the initial set of axioms is made parallel to initial matter, then the completeness of the axiom system becomes parallel to the constructability from matter according to this objective laws of all the sub sub supervening items of the universe. It is, in this sense, analogous to that in which an axiomatic formal system is, say, Godel complete and therefore closed, that the universe of matter is here said to be closed, right? Just this idea that everything is, you know, everything inside the universe uh, comprises matter. That's all he's saying. And when a system is said to be Godel complete, what is meant is that every non initial truth in it is derivable from initial truth alone by use of the rules of derivation. Hence, in the analogy, every form of category in the universe which is not directly matter must be derivable from matter alone in accordance with the dialectical laws of the evolution of matter, right? As I say that, you know, you talk about spirit, you talk about this, you talk about that, you talk about this, all of that is derived from matter, right? Now, what that means, per se, who knows, but then that also is to say that even your mind, your thinking, your self-conscious, your listening, all of that is derived from matter, right? Um... Uh, which again, you know, that's where the meta physics versus metaphysics comes into play, right? So anyway, I suggested that dialectic in that which makes the evolution of kinds possible, that accordingly, which is the ground of the evolution of mind from matter, or quality from quantity, or energy, of energy, sorry, I said or instead of of, uh, which is the ground of the evolution of mind from matter, of quantity from quantity, of energy from mass, this kind of emergence, since it depends on a critical organization of matter, truly represents a leap. When a crisis results in an advance, it is the, it, it is its nature to perpetuate a leap. Um, sorry, it's a little confusing. I'm not confusing, but you know, like the, the wording. Like I said, I'm just getting hungry, and you know, I don't know if you guys, you guys can't hear, it, but my son's like making a lot of noise, where it's like. Dude, you gotta feed me. You know, and it's like, ah, oh, shoot. Yeah, you're right. Uh, for those who don't know, I kind of started recording this at like 7 a.m. or or 8 a.m. or something like that, and it's like 11:42 a.m. right now. I was expecting my son to stay asleep. I woke up prematurely, and so I was like, let me just record this because I want to finish reading this stuff before November. So I'm like, let me record this. But you know, like when your son wakes up, and he's like, he's he's nice enough to like step out of the way, but at the same time, it's like he wants to eat. You know what I mean? Um, so, so that's like, that's part of it. And you might be like, dude, just hurry up. So you go feed your kid. I intend to, I'm just giving you guys some backdrop. All right. So <laughs> like, like appreciate something. Damn it. All right. All right. I have suggested that dialectic is that which makes the evolution of kinds possible. That accordingly, which is the ground of the evolution of mind from matter, of quality from quantity of energy from mass, right? He's basically saying dialectic is the idea that things can change 
is what gives it so on and so forth. So this kind of emergence, like things could have changed to even the opposite or whatever, right? This kind of uh, emergence, since it depends on a critical organization of matter, truly represents a leap. When a crisis results in advance, it is the nature to perpetuate a leap. The solution of a crisis always represents a discontinuity, and just as in the foundation of mathematics, critical numbers represent a break in the continuity in the evolution of numbers, so in nature does the emergence of quality from quantity it represent a break in the continuity of a quantitative process. A, it is important that dialectical evolution cannot, can uh, be not conceived as a being linear, continuous, and monodirectional. Evolution, so conceived, has no explanation to offer, and especially it gives no explanation to the transformation of one kind into another, for it only represents an accumulation of phenomena of the same sort. Linear evolution is incompatible with the evolution of kinds, because the evolution of kinds represents a linear discontinuity. In dialectical evolution, past progress is not linear. It is, so to say, from one plane to another. It is through a leap from one plane to another that new kinds are produced and the emergence of mind from matter attained. The dialectical, so basically, yeah, so like, 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 here's what he's saying right here, like emergency of mind from matter, right? It's like, like, I don't know if cockroaches could think, but let's say they can't, right? Let's say roaches can't think, let's say ants can't think, let's say whatever, right? Eventually, right, from no thought comes thought, and it's just a leap. It's not a continuity, it's not that, you know, insects could think barely, it's not that plants could think barely. I mean, and that's to say if you believe whether or not plants or insects could think, but the idea is that at some point, something could think where something couldn't before. You know? That's it. It's a leap. It's not, it's not a continuity, not a continuity. It's a linear discontinuity. It's just boom, it could think. You know? Um, and of course, you know, if you guys are familiar with dialectical materialism, hopefully he's going to go into it. But like this idea of, you know, capitalism, just, just different from feudalism. It's just not the same. It's not, you know, oh, we're developing into a, you know, it's just, here's a new system. You know, um, that's it, right? All right. So anyway, uh, I just, just, and I'm just explaining it for you guys because it is kind of complicated. Um, but you know, fortunately, I'm able to explain it. I hope. I hope you. I hope you can see how I explain it. And you know, part of me subconsciously also recognizes that this video is so long that nobody is really listening to it anymore. But <laughs> you know, part of me recognizes that part. So um, you know. So it's like, part of me is just like, uh, okay, maybe I don't have to, uh, maybe I should stop, right? But anyway, I'm going to just keep going. All right, so the dialectical materialist position on mine must be distinguished from the, yeah, must be distinguished from the epiphenomenalist one. For the former, mind is a development from matter. For the latter, it is merely something which accompanies the activity of matter. So the dialectical materialist position on mind must be distinguished from an epiphenomenalist, eph a feminist one, uh, for the former mind is a development from matter. For the latter, it is merely something which accompanies the activity of matter. Sorry, I just want to say, I just want to point out that because I'm going to put this live, I actually have to listen four hours of this video again, you know, which is not really too bad. I like it, but at the same time, I'm like, I'm going to have to record. listen. And I know Fun Polk are not going to be tuning around for four hours. So it's just like in the back of my mind, like, damn it. How could I have made it shorter? But I didn't. So, you know, hope, but obviously I think people are going to come to the video, play it back later, play it back later, but I got to listen to it live, so it's a little different. All right. So the dialectical materialist position on mind must be distinguished from an epiphenoma. I don't even know this word. Epif but you see the word epiphany. So epiphenomalist. All right. One. Uh, for the former, mind is a development from matter, right? For the latter, it is merely something which accompanies the activity of matter, right? So one of them, so the dialectical materialist position on mind is that mind is a development from matter, right? While this one is that uh, mind accompanies the activity of matter, right? It's just something that accompanies matter. So it's impossible to conceal the fact that through the ages, materialism has been the butt of numerous quips. The most fashionable criticism in antiquity was on the question of purpose and consciousness. It was felt by the critics of materialism that there were certain, usually undisclosed, conceptually difficulties to prevent the emergence of purpose and consciousness from that which is without 
purpose and without consciousness. This kind of objection has been met in the discussion of categorical conversion. A more important objection to materialism is alleged to be provided by the theory of relativity. Uh, okay, so he's going to theory of relativity, which is you know Einstein's thing. This objection is important because dialectical materialism itself upholds science, right? So he's like, oh, well, you know, dialectical materialism likes science, so why is it that science is going against us, right? <laughs> and why is it objected by science? All right. So according to this objection, relativity's merging of space-time constitutes an objection to materialism, whether dialectical or serene. Yeah, so basically, you know, like I said, I'm in the physics, right? So um, space-time, so again, he's just showing you the breadth. Again, he's the president of Ghana. I believe he's the president of Ghana at this point. So he's the, yeah, yeah, because it's 1964. So let me see. I'm just going to double check. Uh, I believe he's like the president of Ghana. So he's like writing about the, uh, yeah, so yeah, he's the president of Ghana. He's writing about, um, yeah, so he's the president of Ghana until, up until 1966, right? So he's writing about this deeply, like writing about th relativity and materialism as the president of Ghana. Like, this is this is pretty impressive for, for, for anybody. But again, he's just showing you the breadth of, yeah, I'm going to write a philosophy book, but I know philosophy, I even know the theory of relativity in so much as I understand space-time constitutes an objection to materialism. You know, I'm not just like a philosopher, I'm also well-versed in physics. Uh, you know, I'm supposed to actually read about this. Uh, I'm supposed to read the relativity book. I didn't read it yet. Uh, merging of space-time constitutes an objection to materialism, whether dialectical or serene. This is a nagging feeling that which the merging of space and time matters life in space and its movement in time are snuffed out. Uh, but this nagging feeling can be soothed by the reflection that the only independent reality which philosophical materialism allows in matter, and since absolute time and absolute space must be conceived as independent if they are absolute, in a way they are incompatible with philosophical materialism. The abandonment of both would therefore be so far from representing the disgrace of philosophical materialism that it would be its triumph, right? So this right here, I could imagine, if you're not familiar with materialism, if you're not familiar with relativity, this could be a complicated one. So we're going to look back at it just, just for... Uh, and my, my son would make a lot of noise. I don't know if you heard that. He was pretty annoying. It was pretty annoying. But uh, um, according to the objection, relativity's merging of space-time constitutes an objection to materialism. So basically... Space and time are are, are, are are functionally the same, right? Um, it's just it's just a matter of the the, the observer's uh, perspective in a sense, right? Uh, whether dialectical or serene, like like basically, uh, space and time are curved by matter. Okay, so matter curves space and time, and, and, and so everything is you know if you, if you will, I just use the word relative, you know, <laughs> right? All right, so it's object to materialism, whether dialectical or serene. This is a nagging feeling that the merging of space and time matters, life in space, and its movement in time are snuffed out, right? Uh, but this nagging feeling can be soothed by the reflection that the only independent reality which philosophical materialism allows is matter, right? The only independent reality which philosophical materialism allows is matter. And since absolute time and absolute space must be conceived as independent if they are absolute, in a way they are incompatible with philosophical materialism. The abandonment of both would therefore be so far from representing the disgrace of philosophical materialism that it would be a triumph. So yeah, that's a, I don't say a mouthful, but you guys get it. He's just saying, he's he's, he's saying more of, like he's saying, there's, there's only so many things that he can be saying from this. Uh, and it like, I feel like this one kind of doesn't follow from the other one, but maybe it does. So, but it's not really not that critical uh, for you uh, to, to, to grasp. Um, but, I, but, I, but of course, I, feel, I have a feeling that you listening, you do grasp it. So you're just like, yeah, I get it. You know what I mean? All right, so uh, me the mechanism of sensation too has sometimes been brandished in the face of philosophical materialism. This is in fact a species of skepticism. Sensation, it is said, is our primary avenue to knowledge. Mankind, it is alleged, had no road to knowledge save the highway of sensation. Both, but sensation does not give us any direction, direct knowledge of matter. Hence, there is no reason to suppose that there is any such thing as matter. So they're saying, hey, look, why do you say matter exists, right? So I, say, I believe that this adumbrated skepticism turns it upon itself. 
It is not possible to use the physics of perception to impugn the reality and independence of the external world, for the physics of perception itself presupposes and relies upon the reality and independence of the external world. It is only through some occult reasoning that physics can be used to locate the external world inside our mind, right? So basically he just goes back to the whole book. You know, your senses do not create the world, right? And let's keep going. It is further said that not all the processes in the physiology of perception are physical. It is said by way of expansion that if light did not strike the eye, an image form on the retina, etc., we could not see. But the traveling of light and the forming of an image on the retina could not either singly or collectively be the inwardness of the of that illumination which is seeing. The processes are accounted to be so far from explaining perception that they deepen the mystery. And yet, to a certain extent, all this must be deemed to be correct when it is made a basis for idealism. However, then an indulgence in fallacy occurs. We know that in normal physiological and physical conditions, we cannot choose whether to see or not. If spirit or consciousness were completely independent of matter for its arising, there should be the possibility of such a breakdown in perception as are not completely explicable in terms of physiology and physics. The doctor, one supposes, would then need to be aided occasionally by the priest, as indeed was supposed to be the case in the dark ages of knowledge. Our universe is a natural universe, and its basis is matter with its objective law. So, in a sense, you kind of see he kind of builds up to all these other philosophies. The, at the end of the day, the philosophy that realistically is the case is matter, and 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 and, and the natural universe is just a bunch of materialistic laws. So. This objection right here, I'm going to admit, um, where is it, right here, is something that maybe I probably should reread. Um, where is it? Oh, yeah, right here. I probably should reread it just to, uh, just because we're wrapping up, and it's like, maybe it might be something that somebody wants to understand. So we're just going to go back to it. Um, this is a, just, just to clarify the context. Um, a more important objection to materialism is alleged to be provided by the theory of relativity, whose objection is important because down to materialism itself of whole science, right? According to this objection, relativity's merging of space-time. And remember that he's using dialectic materialism, which is Marx's philosophy, Marx's philosophy uh, from Hegel. Uh, these people did not have relativity to address. You know, relativity is more like Einstein, which is around the 1930s. 1920s kind of thing, 1940s, whatever, right? But, um, and this is, he's writing in the 1960s, but Marx is more from like 1850s and, and, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, so according to the objection, relativity's merging of space-time constitutes an objection to materialism, whether dialectical or serene, right? Does it say that, um, that, that these things are not separate? Space and time are not separate, and therefore, you know, you can't, like, you can't look at it from a separate place. It's just, this is a nagging feeling that with the merging of space and time, matters, life and space, and its movement in time are snuffed out, right? But this nagging feeling can be soothed by the reflection that the only independent reality which philosophical materialism allows is matter. So he's like, look, if you just look at philosophical materialism as only allowing matter, right, then you don't have to worry about whether or not it's, you know, like uh, whether or not like time and space, you know, relate to that, right? So he's like, and since absolute time and absolute space must be conceived as independent, if they are absolute, right? If they have absolute time and they have absolute space, in a way they are incompatible with. It, so as independent, if they are absolute, in a way they are are incompatible with philosophical materialism. So this is where I, I think it's a little bit like tricky, where he says it's incompatible with philosophical philosophical materialism, even though he's really saying that. Like, even though his argument is that philosophical period allows, you know, allows it, right? So he's like, uh, the abandonment of both would therefore be so far from representing a disgrace to philosophical materialism that it would be its triumph. So it's, 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 uh, yeah. So again, like, it is, this is more like a convoluted, rationalistic kind of, you know, uh, argumentation that it's kind of like, He's just acknowledging that relativity exists, and he says, "Look, even if you think relativity can contradict this, the the trouble with you trying to make relativity contradict this is that, realistically speaking, it would contradict itself in a sense, you know, or it just wouldn't contradict relativity. Like it would be, it would be a triumph of this philosophical materialism in a sense, right? Um, 
that kind of thing. So it's it's a little bit. So that might be like I would probably put this as like the hardest paragraph in this document. But other than that, you know, I'm grateful for you guys listening. I know, like, I'm kind of mad that I'm going to listen to this live by myself. Um, kind of mad. Kind of mad that I had uh, uh, the audio cut off right from. Uh, like, I, I'm not too sure, but I'm going to go check page 15. But other than that, I appreciate you for listening to this chapter one. Next week, again, it will be chapter two, so make sure you subscribe. Uh, obviously, get your notebook out, whatever. And we're going to try to finish this off. I'm going to try to record these in advance of November. All right, sorry, in advance of the end of November so that I can, uh, uh, you know, for December, I could do some other stuff. But uh, other than that, you know, I appreciate you for listening. Thank you so much. And until next time, Shami Amahotep, Anku Jaseneb Neb, Amen, Ma'at, Dua Nature.